2016 school board meeting. If everybody could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item one on our agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Do we have any adjustments tonight? Seeing none, moving on to item two, approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the school board minutes. Um, a, B, C, D, can I do that? <laughs> or do I have to list all the dates? You can. Um, as listed. Um, a, as listed, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. And item three, comments by student representatives. Hello, everyone. So it's been a pretty big month and a half we've had um, a lot of students garner individual awards and some of those being we had a congressional art award given to one of our students by Shelly Pingree. Um, jazz Ensemble also took fourth place at the Berkeley High School Jazz Festival. And in terms of extra pairs of sports, we have many teams still participating in playoffs and some of those teams being um, boys hockey, girls and, um, excuse me, Boys and girls basketball and the swim team, both boys and girls won Southwesterns recently. And the Western Maine Conference um, meet for track was postponed due to weather. And I know some students were disappointed about that because had they not qualified previously in other meets, it was potentially their last chance to qualify for states. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then <clears throat> in terms of other extracurriculars, we just had our Model United Nations team got back. They had a conference at Boston University this past weekend. And we had um, people win best position paper, uh, verbal commendation, and um, best delegate award, which I believe is the highest award that you can get at a Model United Nations conference. Not fairly positive, because I've never been to one, but that's, that's what I think. Um, also, our World Affairs Council is doing a big fundraiser at Tika, the Mediterranean restaurant in Portland, tomorrow night. So they're partnering with Tika to do, I think it's a three-course meal. Um, for I think are like fifty dollars, fifty dollars, fifty dollars, yeah. and, then, and um, then some of the proceeds proceeds go to WAC, so it's going to be a really good time, to, and you know just a good fundraising opportunity to get everyone to learn a little bit more about Mediterranean cuisine, because that's something that um, everybody always has a lot of fun in WAC with trying different foods, so that's something that is always a good time. Um, let's see. Also, we had a couple people win um, awards from the Scholastic art and writing competition. We had people win honorable mention, silver key, and I believe we had two people get um, gold key and American Voices nominee, so that is a big accomplishment for them. Um, and lastly, this is the last week before February break, which is super nice. Um, I guess it's a little bit stressful for some people because teachers kind of tend to pile on work in the last week before break, um, but we're both second semester seniors now, yeah. so <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> a little bit of the pressure's off. Um, some people, as you know, big time for college process, so uh, people will be hearing back from schools as well come March and April, yep. so in these next few weeks. People I have will be getting probably six or stress. seven more weeks, and then I'll start hearing back from places. So, Yeah, yeah. Well, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, we're moving on to item four, which is comments from the public on agenda items. Are there any members of the public here tonight that would like to step up and comment? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to item five, communications. And I believe I see Senator Millette about to do some legislative sentiments. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you here this evening. 
Um, after the student report, I believe I will be visiting you again <laughs> sometime soon. It's really wonderful the breadth and depth of all of the various programs that our students are involved in and um, how wonderfully talented and hardworking that they are. So my, my early congratulations to all of those. So I'm here with a number of sentiments and um, I think we'll start off with the high school golf team and I believe they're here if they'd like to join me. Ooh, and they're carrying some pretty impressive. Wow, look at that. That's great. So we in the state legislature we really uh, enjoy taking the opportunity to recognize the achievements of, of our citizens across the state of Maine, young and old. Um, but I think our favorite is when our youth um, have these special accomplishments. And so this evening, um, I have with me a legislative sentiment, and it says, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School golf team of Cape Elizabeth, which won the 2015 Class B State Championship. Members of the team include Bryce Hewitt, Michael Mangravito, Hans Croft, Patrick McDonald, Casey Cludia, Cole Spencer, Lowen, I'm sorry, Lauren Schoenwolf, Alex Glidden, Peter Haber, Ryan Collins, Max Altenauer, Mia Spencer, Chris Laprade, Jack Kelly, Austin Legg, Mike McKenzie, and Hope Campbell. And I apologize if I missed him, and I'm hopefully I got everyone. We extend to all the to all the members of the team our congratulations and best wishes, and be it ordered that this official expression of the sentiment be sent forth with on behalf of the 127th legislature and the people of the state of Maine, and it's signed by the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, and it's sponsored by m uh, myself and Representative Monahan and Representative Hammond, who I believe are still caught up in um, legislative business up in Augusta, or else they would be here to join me in saying congratulations. So, here you go. Hey, uh, would the students like to say anything? Do you have any comments for us? Lauren does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh wait, there's a horn. Oh, yeah, we're good. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, our coach really wanted to be here this evening, but he has a newborn baby boy in Tampa, Florida. So um, he just wanted to, we wanted to just say thank you to the school board and Cape Athletics for supporting us and hopefully we can come back here again next year. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations everyone. And I have one more. And um, I, I will spare you all the legislative ease for this, for this particular round, but um, we join in recognizing Ryan Collins of Cape Elizabeth, a student at Cape Elizabeth High School who won the 2015 State Class B Individual Golf Championship together with another golfer in a tie. Is that correct? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you have a couple more years to correct that, I believe. We extend to Ryan our congratulations and best wishes, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th Legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Lauren said, uh, I'd like to thank the school board for their support and also my teammates for their support throughout the entire season. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. And I actually have one more item which you do not know about, or perhaps you do, but um, I believe that January we designated as a School Board Member Recognition Month. And it was a joint resolution that I sponsored and was co-sponsored by a whole list of legislators here. I've had that joint resolution printed out because I don't think we do enough to thank all of you for your service, your energy, your commitment, and your passion. And I am going to read this just because I can. <laughs> <clears throat> the State of Maine in the year of our Lord 2016 joint resolution designating January School Board Member Recognition Month 
whereas it is the mission of Maine school administrative units to provide all students with the best possible education in order that they may be prepared for productive and rewarding lives, and whereas school boards are accountable for the education of Maine's children, and whereas school boards articulate a vision for their school systems, set high academic standards, and approve the hiring of the staff who make that vision a reality, and whereas school boards chart the educational goals and direction of their communities as they work with administrators, teachers, parents, and local residents while serving as advocates for public education. And whereas school boards set the policies and procedures that govern all aspects of school operations and adopt the budgets that provide the resources necessary to meet the needs of all students. And whereas all of these responsibilities and more are met by volunteer school board members who put in countless hours in meetings and in their communities advocating for their schools, representing the interests of children and parents and other members of their communities, and preserving the value tradition of local control over kindergarten to grade 12 public education. Now therefore be it resolved that we, the members of the 127th legislature, now assembled in the second regular session, on behalf of the people we represent, take this opportunity to express our appreciation to members of all school boards in the state. I won't continue on. There's a couple <laughs> more paragraphs, but you get the gist. And again, my thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca, we really appreciate you taking the time to bring these, uh, it sounds a little self-aggrandizing, but typically the, uh, to bring recognition to the students. And I know that the students and the board really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, moving on to item 5C. B. Oh, B. Duh, goodness. I can, I know the alphabet. <laughs> Library Instructional Technology Specialists. Three of them with us. I have seen Amanda Kazaka, Carolyn Young, and Jonathan Werner, uh, who are our library instructional technology team across the middle and high school, and they'll tell you about their work this year. I'm sorry, but does anyone have a dongle? The technology department needs one. <laughs> <laughs> or is there Apple TV? Oh, seriously. <laughs> that was a test, actually. <clears throat> Carolyn to the rescue. How to plug it in is apparently one of the Go ahead. Um, that was a performance assessment. Exactly. <laughs> Carolyn passed. No pressure. Rest, rest <laughs> oh, you mean you want me to? I'll turn it on for you. Um, Well, well, while we wait for that to warm up, um, I'm Carolyn Young. I'm the Library and Instructional Technology Specialist at the high school. This is my third year um, working at the high school, and I'm really very happy to be there. And um, as Meredith said, this is Amanda Kozaka. She's a middle school library instructional technologist. And this is Jonathan Werner, and he is across both schools, um, part-time at the high school and part-time at, um, at the middle school. So there is our beautiful presentation. So I'm actually going to talk to you. We're going to keep it very brief and kind of give you a taste of what's happening in both schools right now and kind of across the schools. So this is a picture of um, what's on our website right now. This is our website header. And I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, our website, which we like to call our Digital Library Learning Commons. And this is something that I actually take great, quite a bit of pride in because I spend a lot of time working on it. So um, we in the Library and Learning Commons Department feel that the digital presence of the library is very, very important. It's something that we want to keep um, updated and useful for students. We live in an age where students have access to the internet, they have access to each other um, 24 hours a day, and we kind of want to make a place where um, they feel as though they can get information um, easily and they can access, uh, access it in a way that's not really, really confusing. So we kind of maintain um, this library and learning commons, this digital library and learning commons as a 24-7 virtual library presence. Um, 
I at the high school use it to kind of serve as a hub for research projects that we work on um, with students right now. So you can kind of see at the top, it's in a blog format. We are focused, um, at the high school, we're focusing on a freshman iSearch um, research project. So across the entire ninth grade and all the English classes, freshmen are all coming into the library and we are doing um, a research project where they pick a topic of their choice and they do an in-depth research project on it. Today, I had a number of students come in and take a look at a couple of um, hoax websites and decide whether or not they were real websites or not, how they, if they decide, if decide whether or not they could rely on the information using an information checklist that we went over as a group. And then I gave them five links and a digital document for them kind of to go through and look at. So that's kind of an example of some of the stuff we are doing at the high school um, right now. At the high school level, we'll, uh, we are also working on um, something called audio book talks, which um, I'm very excited about it. I've worked with a number of freshmen and sophomore English classes. Um, an English teacher came to me and said that she was having her students do um, independent reading books. They had to read a book a quarter or multiple books per quarter, depending on the English class they were in. But it was difficult to keep students still focused on that independent reading with all the work that they have um, assigned to them. So we kind of worked together and developed something called um, an audio book talk, which we have linked on our website. So students would, in iMovie, they would um, and I came to their classes and I talked to them all about this. And um, there, all the audio book talks that students put together are right there. And I'm, I was going to play one for you guys, but I'm not sure about the audio situation right here. But I came to, is it? So I came to a number of um, English classes and I gave them an example of one that I made. And it's actually on the library website. I can show you what I showed um, students. If I scroll through, these are all sorts of lessons that we've been teaching. So I showed them an example that I made. I was reading The Martian at the time, and I talked to them a little bit about um, what makes a good book talk. So they had to introduce their book. They had to read a passage from their book and explain why they chose that pas passage and what it was, um, what it meant particularly to them. It was supposed to be short and kind of a way to get other students excited about reading books. So this is an example of one that a freshman student put together. So let me just put in the audio. Oh, that's fine. two opposites coming together. So I'll start it over. Legend by Mary Lou is the exciting story of two opposites coming together. Told in two different perspectives, legend is set in future America or the United States as we know it has fallen apart. The country has split into three sects, the Republic, the Patriots, and the Colonies, which are all at constant war. June and Day are complete opposites. June is the Republic's new favorite agent, the prodigy has lived under the Republic's wing all her life and is yet to see the darker side of the Republic. Day is the Republic's most wanted criminal. He has lived in the port. So that's kind of a test, uh, a taste of what we um, had students do. They kind of got started on that on their own. She chose that passage herself, and it was really kind of exciting to share those with um, other students in their class and other students across classes when they were done. So that's a project that I'm pretty excited about and we're continuing it for the next quarter with a few English classes as well. So those are kind of some of the things that are currently happening right now at the high school level um, with me. I will now turn the mic over to Jonathan. Um, so both Amanda and I have felt like we get a lot of press literally on the front page when we do uh, when we did the renovation of the library and learning commons, but I would really urge you to take a look at this. Um, Amanda and I have virtually nothing to do with it. Um, Carolyn's work is extraordinary, and if you look at everything from her, um, t her tutorial videos, it's a really remarkable resource, both for teachers and for students, and one I hope you'll take a more careful look at. So I've had the opportunity through the um, international, how's this for, I'm the president-elect of the International Society of Technology and Education Librarians Network, and as a librarian and instructional technology specialist, it takes me about 10 minutes, and thank you very much, I'm done, um, to introduce myself. So through this, I met Nikki Roberts, Robertson, who said to me, if you don't tell your story, someone else will, and you won't like their version quite as much as you like yours. By which she means, as a library, we really have a duty and a responsibility to um, put our story out there and let people know exactly what we're doing so that we are portrayed in the way that we feel is accurate, hence our taking the podium this evening. Um, 
as a piece of that, we had the opportunity to host the main association of school libraries, uh, Spring Fling, and brought in David Lorcher as the keynote speaker, who is the founder of the Learning Commons model. And at that event, he declared it the year of the Learning Commons, which was incredibly exciting for us. And we brought in 55 different schools, I believe, um, more than that, I think, to attend AuthorFest as well as um, the Spring Fling. And that was an extraordinary opportunity to share our work. As I said, through the Librarians Network, um, I've had an opportunity to tell our story in a number of different places, um, in Boston, in Chicago, and here in Maine. And then we've been visited now by these five districts in the last six months, totaling about 45 visitors. Wingfleet School is undergoing a proposed renovation for its lower school, and they came to look at us. Burlington Schools in Massachusetts is probably the foremost learning commons um, and student tech team model in our region. And for them to come, as Tom Charletray said, um, is a little bit like having the Messiah show up at church and sit in the audience. So it was a rather remarkable moment for us to feel like we had the opportunity to share with them and that they were looking to us for guidance around technology integration. So that's just, a, as Carolyn said, a taste of the kinds of things we're doing. So it is our third year in a row of presenting to the school board, and um, each time we, we come before you, and we're very grateful, so thank you for letting us come and speak to you. Um, each time we try to capture um, a snapshot of where we are now, um, early on we talked a lot about where we were and what we're moving away from, and lately I feel like we talk more about where we are now and where can we go next. Um, so our talks tend to be in those themes, um, and because I, we have given ourselves 90 seconds, I wrote this stuff down, um, we're trying to demonstrate for you what we in our jobs as library and instructional technology specialists um, can demonstrate, how we demonstrate our innovative thinking, um, goal setting, both short and long term goal setting, um, risk taking, healthy risk taking. Um, uh, we try to show you where, where we were and where we're going. This year, I feel like it's important for us to talk about where we are with where the students are and where the students are going. We talk a lot about how the, the library and learning commons is modeled after student needs. We've talked about the four C's of 21st century learning, which are collaboration, communication, I'm trying not to look at my notes, critical thinking, and communication. And if we designed our space to afford students those opportunities, how can we design our programming to further um, provide those opportunities? This year, we're so fortunate that um, our administrators, uh, Mike Tracy and Doug Purley, found a way to build our program into our schedule. Um, it's been a struggle that we've had as long as I've ever been a librarian. If you're not a fixed schedule, how are you requiring teachers to or students to come into the library? Um, and we have this really great opportunity this year to connect with all of the fifth grade students and all of the sixth grade students um, in a course that originally was going to be a digital citizenship course. And I use the air quotes because the name you know, what kid's going to say, hey, it's time for digital citizenship class. Um, it's not a catchy name. It's so important. Um, but it originally started as, we need to talk about this. We need to address the reality that di digital citizenship, and this, maybe this is why I didn't want to name it that. I can barely say it. Um, it's not just something we have to talk about. Put my hands away. It's not just something we have to talk about, it's something that we really have to address and recognize as a set of skills and as a decision making process that students and citizens need to learn. Um, and from that grew this concept that our class is called Idea Lab. I'll talk more in depth about it with Mr. Tracy in a little while. Um, it's called Idea Lab, modeled after the four C's, um, to stand for Innovate, Discover explore and amaze, and lab specifically because it's more of an experimental time than a, than a class or a project, for example. And what we do in that class with students is um, provide opportunities for a level of engagement that they, students are saying they don't see very often in their school day. Um, whether we call it Genius Hour, and if, you if you're not sure about the concept of, of a Genius Hour, look it up. It started with Google, but the idea that at least 20% of your time should be spent pursuing personal interests 
um, exploring curiosities, um, being innovative and taking risks. Um, modeled after that, we see through activities like a cardboard challenge. Um, one of the links we'll share later is to uh, Kane's arcade video, which is about a student who very creative and innovative and built a, basically a car, an arcade out of cardboard. Um, if you give kids a pile of cardboard and some tape, what could they do if they were inspired to do that? Um, we have very personalized, very individualized learning. We have independent projects. We have um, community-based projects and outreach and all of those activities that build on what those essential skills are, what are in fact our guiding principles. If you look at the, if you're familiar with the guiding principles um, here in the state of Maine, um, what we're doing really affords students those opportunities. Um, that is what I'm right now the most proud of. Um, if you were to walk into our library and some of these visitors that Mr. Werner mentioned, um, some of them stumbled into the library on a day when it was, you know, messy, really messy, noisy, um, seemed possibly chaotic, seemed confused and very energized. Um, and that's what we want to see. Um, to some, it's, it's a very uncomfortable sight, and it's, it's, it's not what we expect from libraries. But it's when I've seen, in all of my time working with students, when I've seen real, genuine engagement from students, and from that also see marked growth in their behavior and their attitudes towards school, and their willingness to take risks and problem solve. And it does circle back to digital citizenship. Um, because when we're asking students to make responsible choices in their digital presence, um, to be informed members of our community and, and responsible citizens, those are the qualities we want them to have. We want them to be innovative and risk-taking, healthy risk-taking. Um, we want them to, to feel inspired to pursue personal interests. So what I'm most um, proud of right now at the middle school is our Idea Lab class, um, our opportunities to work excuse me, to work more with students and um, how we are modeling the growth mindset um, that our students really need to have in order to, to thrive. So we want to finish with um, an opportunity for questions from you, but um, for us looking ahead, two of the things we are really focused on are thinking about ways to develop a scope and sequence from K to 12 for both uh, digital citizenship and information literacy so that a student entering in kindergarten begins to develop a skill set that grows throughout their experience in the district. Um, Tom Charletre has done a fantastic job doing that in the digital sphere and Cam Rosenblum in the uh, literacy and library skills sphere and already inheriting those students as fifth and sixth graders. Um, teachers in those teams have said they don't have to teach direct instruction around Google documents, for example, or Google Drive. Instead, they can just assume it's something that the students know. And um, I can quote Kelly. She said in a meeting of the administrators that um, Tom has pretty much single-handedly transformed digital um, sensibility in that building and the way in which people assume it is a part of their day-to-day -day work. So I wanted to highlight both of their work as well, though they're not here this evening. So allowing us to expand on that with a cross-building department that allowed K through 12 conversations to take place and helped us work through um, my magnificent ability to straggle, straddle, straggle too, but straddle two buildings is really the only opportunity we have to carry between eighth and ninth grade and Tom and I collaborate with our fourth and ninth grade E-teams uh, to host events like the Google Apps for Families that's coming up and our most recent Coder Express. And to that end, seeing how it works to have one and a half of us in each building um, realizing that having two in each building would be very powerful in terms of providing tech integration, professional development, and the opportunity to co-teach. All three of us have some of our most rewarding moments when we're side by side with teachers. And at the moment, if I'm gone, Carolyn can't leave the room and vice versa with Amanda. So the ability to have that stationary and mobile person would be a pretty extraordinary development for us. So, what questions can we take from you? Is the um, the Idea Lab or is that daily? Meet daily with each grade, fifth and sixth, uh, or is that <laughs> often it works out, out? It works out to that. Uh, the way it's a it's a complicated way that it fits into the schedule because it's a three week rotation. But in fifth in fifth grade over the course of three weeks, students will have 
um, five days worth of idea lab classes. They'll have five days worth of um, library time where they're generally looking, browsing books and, and having, um, having time in the library for that. And some work with Mr. Purley in the fifth grade, which is most akin to guidance lessons, I would say, and sort of builds on some of the idea lab concepts that, you know, the community mindedness. Um, sixth grade, it gets a little even more complicated, but trust me when I say over two week time, we have every class for five hours. It's tricky on a day-to-day -day basis, but essentially we do see students um, originally, uh, this is our risk taking and our flexibility here, the schedule at the beginning of the year has changed up until now without changing and influencing any teachers' schedules at all. We've adapted a bit. Um, Fifth grade, it's 20 minutes a day. Sixth grade, it's a full block Perfect. over two weeks, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's not it's not every class every day, but we see every student a fair amount, a lot more than we used to, yeah. which is really what we're going for. And that's another example. I can't teach Idea Lab in the morning with fifth graders, so that would be a great opportunity for us to have that kind of yeah. circular. Well, to see is. to have to work with students more often because yeah. really I work with them every three weeks for five yeah. days. I don't have a question, but I like to uh, comment that it's so uh, refreshing um, your enthusiasm. I think I've uh, been fortunate enough to be here for your uh, three presentations and I imagine if we feel your enthusiasm students must really uh, draw on it as well and uh, I will say I wasn't on Twitter until someone told me to follow uh, Mr. Warner and uh, I think in two days I read uh, the record number of tweets so um, you know thank you for putting yourself out there and for, for your enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you. We truly So I don't really have a question either, but I have a comment to make as well in terms of what you saw earlier with the high school page and the um, research um, like websites. Um, I would like to say that during sophomore year and junior year, we were required to both do um, a research, a long research project sophomore year and then a policy paper junior year. I don't think I and many of the other students would have been able to get through um, gathering in all of our sources and I can say that when I couldn't find like a credible source or couldn't necessarily find the author, Miss Young helped me out on that and I just wanted to um, show that I was appreciative of her help and all of the resources in terms of like um, global CQ researcher and all of those um, databases we have access to. It's great to hear that you remember the name of a database after <laughs> I told you. And um, we have your check for afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, we would, for our research projects, we would go and we'd meet with Ms. Young and Mr. Warner, and they would, we'd have entire classes where they would just show us how to use um, a research database that they all seemed a little bit overwhelming at first because you don't realize how much information is out, incredible information is out there until you can get on one of those databases. Um, and like Montana said, I, especially sophomore year when I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of researching. Um, I mean, that, that was really, really valuable for being able to actually complete the project in a satisfactory manner. Um. <laughs> and being able to take those skills in terms of keywords to put in or how to narrow down your search has definitely helped because I've used it multiple times over the years, not yep. just on big research projects, but if I was doing small, like in-class projects, I've mm -hmm. been able to access the databases too. So. I think in the places where we've seen that happen, um, Laura Briggs, has a pretty remarkable Egypt study program in sixth grade. And then by ninth grade in the eye search paper, we do see the places where that circles or whatever that's called, circles back. Um, and we get the opportunity to see in those individual students the growth, but it isn't because it isn't district wide and it isn't K-12. For other students, they don't have that same experience. So we have sort of highlighted, we can highlight individuals who have those skill sets that develop, but. We'd love to see that be the case for everyone. I just want to call out one thing, which I was going to do in my superintendent's report, but since Jonathan is here, I just want to recognize Jonathan and Tom Schaltre, who worked collaboratively with administrators from South Portland and Old Orchard Beach recently to host a Saturday Ed Camp, which was attended by educators from all over Maine. 
Um, about 200, all over, yeah, and some from across 55 the 55 districts, that's what the 55 was, yeah. sorry, I had the wrong number. Yeah. <laughs> 55 districts, so a, a really um, impressive model for collaboration and sharing of resources across districts, and they managed to have it totally free to educators, which is also a nice bonus, and additionally, um, some of our students were there, our, the fourth grade E-team went to present um, about its work, and um, really well done, so we appreciate that. And Mike Moyer, who's the, I don't know what his title is, High Muck of, yes, of technology for the state was one of the keynote speakers, as well as two from other states and Apple distinguished educators. So it was really remarkable to see their interest. We obviously, we weren't paying them since it was free. Um, the, their willingness to come and speak was a testament to, to people's excitement about their own professional development, like the Maslow Conference as well. That people are just looking thirsty for ways to, to grow professionally. Thank you very much. We'd be happy to take other questions via email or face to face. Come visit us anytime. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, actually this time to item C for real, uh, Pond Cove School Year 17 Calendar Survey Update. So I've just distributed to the board the survey results. Um, Principal Hassan is here and can probably speak more articulately to those than I can. So good evening, and I'm probably going to wear these to see my writing. And, um, so I wanted to talk to you about, actually I can't see you, so I, I wanted to talk to you um, <clears throat> about the survey results, but also to give you some background information. Um, you received them today, I apologize for the um, lateness of them. We intended to get the survey out earlier, had some tech glitches, but um, with our, thanks to our tech team, um, they got things up for us. And as you can see by the survey results, there was an overwhelming preference for parents to, make, to remain at the five early release days versus the seven early release days, really almost by a two to one margin. Um, and then when we looked at, we asked what, if they would take advantage of um, offerings by community services. Um, there was only a, almost a, a close to 23% said they would and um, around 77% said it was unlikely. And then we, we really wanted to dig down deeper like we did last year to find out why. And um, <clears throat> as you can see by the pie chart, and I'm sorry I don't have it for the public um, as a graphic, but, um, but I, can, I can certainly post these, um, that uh, it was somewhat split, but 27% um, said you're, the family did not need the services. 32% said they had other preferences for their child, but 41% they were concerned about the cost. And um, so <clears throat> to that end, I mean, we really feel these, these days are really critical to our professional development. And I think in the climate right now of the budget climate with this proposed $1 million reduction from the state, we are envisioning that our professional, develop, professional, professional development funds funding will be decreased significantly. Um, and, and that typically is when they do their summer work. So that's when they're, they're paid extra, when, what, what we dole out for, to, for them to attend workshops. And we actually tend to get the biggest bang you know, for our work to get is when we're all together, um, not sending people out, even though those are also valuable. I don't want to diminish that at all, but you know, when we can work collectively together, it's much more valuable. And when it's on site, when it's during the, during the school day, the work day, um, if you will, um, it's at no cost. But it is at a cost to families that this has an impact on, and we also recognize that. So <clears throat> I've spoke to my colleague, um, Principal Shad, um, to see if what 
the likelihood could be for next year if we were able to um, still continue with early release days, if we could have like a, um, a service-oriented um, work for um, or volunteerism for high school students to come up um, to Pond Cove on site and they would run staff supervised activities such as outdoor games, board games, arts and crafts, um, all, all, any really performances, um, anything, music, anything that students we, we could, and it would really be no overhead because we have all the materials. Um, and um, he was very amenable to that. And so we thought that that could be a pal of the way and it could be either at a no cost or a very lo you know, nominal cost to families. And um, I, received, um, I received five emails from families. Four of them were really about the, the day, Monday, that they didn't, they, was there a way, you know, they preferred a different day of the week because um, they saw Mondays as being a tough business day. Um, and one of them just ex really expressed concerns about the impact that it had on um, that particular family, and which, as you can see, is re it was revealed in the outcome of the survey results. So we really want to be responsive to that and, and make it a way, how can, how can we make this, because we see it as an, a great opportunity that's really at no cost to the district, but at the same time, we know that of the impact that it has on families. So we're pretty confident that we can, we could make this work and we can do it right on site. It's no overhead and we could, um, and as far as sa staff supervision, um, I've spoken to Meredith a little bit about this today, you know, have, have an ed tech or two there, um, you know, new superintendent, no, <laughs> just, um, but just have um, somebody there um, that would need to be on site anyway. We would train the students um, and we see um, how it could be a win-win. So we see the value that we've had in working collectively together, because this goes from, right, the, the students are dismissed at 12 noon. Um, by the time they're all out the door, really, it's about 12, 12.15ish. 12 um, teachers have to brief time for half an hour for lunch, and then we start at 12.45, and we've embedded it on Mondays to um, correlate with our um, staff meetings, so we really go right till 4.30, so it's not, it's not a 12.45 to 3.30 um, day. It's a, it's a long day. Um, long afternoon, and um, but it's 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 really been really beneficial and relevant to our professional practice, and we see it, you know, and I know I speak for all of the whole Pond Cove staff as you know we see it really as a way for us to really lift professional practice and have a real true impact on um, student learning. So I present that information to you. You have you know the figures from from the. Um, the survey, and it was sent out to all K-4 families and on the snow day, actually, um, and through yesterday, through, through, um, through yes, late last night, midnight, um, we received 134 responses, and that's, you know, obviously from, from a large population um, of folks who, who hadn't responded, but um, so just, you know, what questions do you have? And we, we did, you know, recognize, I, I did talk to staff, I said it really looks like, you know, the preference would be five, not seven, and they really would just, would just be grateful even just for the five. And we looked at, okay, so if we could pick which five, what would, what would be, and then in going back to um, what um, board member Power said about looking at the number of days in a week and how many does that impact, we, we I think you have those dates um, in front of you, but just for the public's sake, it was, um, um, the first one would be August, uh, no, September 19th, um, which we was around the same time we had it this year. And um, this year we kicked it off with culture and climate, which was very timely. It was really good. You know, it was it was once the students, teachers met their students and really got to know them and you know better. And um, so we didn't want to start it right off the bat. So we did that. Um, and then um, we would skip October because we have a we have a professional development day in October anyway. Um, and then we would use, we would skip November because we have some days in that we have, um, we have vet, the Veterans Day holiday and we also have the Thanksgiving break. But then we would um, go to the first week of December, well, December 5th, and then we would go in at the end of January, January 30th, and then skip February and go to um, March 6th, and then um, 
we decided um, wrapping up March 8th would be the best for us. So we, just, we determined those would be the best days strategically for us on the calendar and what worked and around um, the other things that were going on um, for the school and in the district. So. Kelly, just to clarify, I think you said March 8th, but you meant May 8th. But I did mean May 8th, yes. Skip April and do May 8th. Yes. Questions, I'm sure you have some. So maybe it's just bad math. Are, are you saying skip the May 8th? No, that was me. Um, I had, no, May, we would have May 8th. So we would have September 19th, December 5th, January 30th, March 6th, and May 8th. And we saw, we saw either there were going to be the impact of vacation time in February and April, and also some professional development time in, in parent conferences in October, and the holidays, um, the holiday, extended holiday time in November as being, not being the best times um, to have those days so that we could have um, more continuous learning um, without interruption of full-day instruction. Um, yeah. Hi, Kelly. Uh, it was about this time last year that we were talking about the calendar for FY16, and, um, and one, of the, one of the concerns that several board members had was, you know, how, among some other concerns about splitting up the district K-12 to, like, only having Pong Cove have half days. I remember that. Um, you know, how this would impact families and, and what's their impression and their opinion. And um, I believe that we were hoping to get responses, um, you know, that, that were timely um, and maybe even had an option of how they felt about the half days period versus five versus seven. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of two points. Um, and then j just wondering why we waited until the, you know, Friday, this past Friday, to, to elicit responses. It seemed I like know, and I apologize for that. It, it was, like it was meant, and I talked to Meredith about that earlier, it was intended to be actually back in January. I mean, so it was, um, so I apologize for that. I mean, and I'm happy to, I mean, I don't, I know you're expected to vote tonight, but if you feel, you know, more information is needed. I mean, I'm happy to elicit more information, um, obviously in fairness to families too. Um, but to my, to my first point, um, I just, I, I thought that when we talked about this last year, I, I could be remembering incorrectly, um, that we weren't necessarily looking at, at it as a, as a pilot per se, but we were, we were hinging so much of, you know, whether we would continue it on feedback from families and parents. And so I was surprised with the, with the survey that there wasn't an option for um, how do you feel about these overall know, overall because um, there, there's no there's no room for that feedback in here. And we you know we 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 did talk about that and thought we we would see what you know what kind of response we got and maybe this is you know maybe some of it is telling um, or you know with and I'm certainly. As I said, we, I can do another one. I can also send. I can also send something out to parents, you know, having them give responses. I think if a survey might be more telling and give more more data on that. But I'm I'm happy to do that if if you know it's the board's will that you know for that more more information. Um, and I think I think we as a staff, I think we were sort of under the understanding like we would, you know, we want, because we wanted to increase them that we would see you know was five a good baseline and um, but you know the feedback we haven't I was actually we haven't I, and I my understanding from Meredith is you know some of you got some some emails and I know um, I think it was the last meeting someone expressed when it might have been you that somebody had um, can't remember but the fact that it wasn't a k-12 so you, there weren't babysitters involved and that's one of the things that you know, when I, Jeff and I spoke, you know, this might be a palatable way to have it be really, you know, um, as low of an impact on families um, as possible at, you know, with no, you know, or very low added cost. Um, 
And then I, I did get an email from um, a parent who talked about the, the different types of community services activities, like certain ones might be you know, pr preferable, but other ones might not be because of the age level and the activity. So, um, so we saw a high school um, mentor, op you know, mentor or you know, community services um, extended learning opportunity option as being one that um, would be really low cost or no cost, but also helping you know, being respectful of the responses that parents gave that it had an impact on their families. And um, I'm sorry, I, and I also don't remember, um, has there, what, the other component to this uh, last year was getting uh, feedback from staff, and it, it sounds like everybody wants more. Um, I'm, I'm just, I would love to know, like, how helpful, like, how specific are the, the professional development day subjects you know, being followed and mm -hmm. how helpful are they? Um, I, I don't remember any, any feedback in form of survey or anything from um, We didn't actually feel we needed to do, they would just, you know, we didn't, we didn't do a survey. Um, what we were gonna do f moving forward for next, because they just were resolute that they absolutely wanted to continue them and they wanted more of them. And so, I mean, if they had a choice, they would have one, you know, every month. Um, but I think, um, I mean, as far as like, what the specific dates were allocated for. Um, for the most part, we've kept to that. We've had to change, you know, a couple, actually swap, swap what the topics were, but each one has been really, really valuable. And my, when I speak briefly about, um, you know, when the principals speak a little bit later, um, when I speak briefly, I'm gonna talk about what we're actually doing on our next um, early release day, which is on March 7th. Um, so, which, which involves our mathematics and a, a, a person coming in, but um, they've been in incredibly valuable, but I can also give you, I'm happy to give you more in background information and get that for you um, as far as the details of the days and... Less, was, I'm sorry, oh, my, my last follow-up to that, I'm sorry, is, is for me personally, I'm less interested in the details of, I'm interested in the details of what's being, you know, happening during the, the day, but like, I'm interested in how the teachers are finding it applicable and useful in their daily practice. Yeah. I, I have a question more to Meredith. Um, I'm not surprised that your teachers have found this valuable. Teachers love the chance to be together. I think the piece we need to wrestle with and come to conclusion with our public is, is the ability to access common planning time so different at the elementary level that we need to have a differentiated calendar regularly. Like last year, you had a big push on math, and we, and we got that and supported it. Um, and I'm just not aware at the middle and school and high school level if teachers do have built into the kinds of schedules they have the opportunity to meet as a math department or a seventh grade team that the elementary teachers don't. So if this is gonna be a go forward model for us, then I think we can support it if that, if that need exists because of the scheduling issues. Otherwise, it tends to be around uh, an immediate creeping issue like math was last year. So, mm -hmm. so that would be useful for us to, to know. And Meredith. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I think we've acknowledged, I don't think the timing of the survey may have been ideal. Ideally, we would have sent that out a little bit earlier. Um, and we certainly, if the board wants some additional information about the efficacy of those days from a parental perspective, um, we can gather that additional information. The board doesn't have to adopt the calendar tonight. Uh, but the reason that we went into this last year is because of the schedule at the elementary school. Elementary teachers do not have the same level of planning time that their middle and high school colleagues do have um, for collaboration uh, sort of across grade levels and within grade levels. At uh, the middle and high school, teachers are afforded at the high school, they have an individual planning period daily and a team planning period daily. At the middle school, they have an individual planning period daily and three team planning periods in the six day road out of five. Um, at, and at the elementary school, the current schedule is in the six day rotation that they are meeting once um, as a full grade level team. So that 
that presents a yep. challenge um, in yep. terms of managing the variety of work that they have needed mm -hmm. to tackle in the Latin in recent years with Common Core standards, again, being a school in need of improvement in mathematics and, and the um, programmatic changes that Pancove has implemented with both the writing program and, and with mathematics. So okay. maximizing that time is important. Um, but, but again, what we're wrestling with is what does that mean in terms of lost learning time and interruption to instruction? And, and there are trade-offs to that. Is this the only model for accessing that work? It's not. Um, the other models have a financial cost, typically, yes, if you want to have elementary teachers work um, an additional day, for example, that would be roughly an $18,000 cost for one day. Um, it's an option, and that may be something you know that the board would prefer. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think the administrative team has said um, in its preliminary budget conversations, and we'll talk about that later, that we're going to slash the PD budget because we want to make budget budgetary adjustments that are going to be sustainable over time. But I think again, we're going to be very mindful of how every dollar is spent moving into the next fiscal year. Um, so those kinds of decisions and that use of time become increasingly important. Right. I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, downplay parental feedback. I think the interruption to family life and the need for childcare, those are critically important for families who may have limited options if both parents are working and you know, if community services is financially out of reach. We need to be able, I think, to provide families with some uh, other alternatives. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I think we have to sort of balance the opportunities for staff to collaborate professionally if we're expecting to reach some of the goals that we've set as a district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just comment. Um, we would encourage if uh, the needs at the middle school are different than the needs of Pond Cove, and if the needs of the high school are different than the needs of middle school or Pond Cove, that uh, teachers work with the administrators on what solution is best for that school. You know, elementary school is different than a middle school. It's different than a high school. They have different schedules. Therefore, they have different needs for, for pre professional development. And you know, I think longer term or, you know, maybe next year, you know, if the board so f sees, like, you know, what is the overall options for professional development, it does come down to a cost benefit. Um, if they have summer um, workshops, you know, district wide or for one school, there is an economic cost. If you do it during the school day, it's less instructional time. You know, I don't think if we, you know, we, we, we asked for a survey, we have responses. I think the, we know what number of responses we've received from parents that this didn't work for their families. And in Cape Elizabeth, since I've been on the board, if there's an overwhelming uh, disagreement with an issue, there's no shortage of, of feedback from parents. So um, I think it's good to have the survey, but as a board, we're not gonna get uh, you know, a survey, what should the board do? It's weighing these different factors. So um, I don't know if we're voting on this time for the, the calendar, does that, or does that come later? And so my point is, you know, just if Pond Cove may do it differently than middle school, high school. If, you know, if there's one model that works for all schools, fine. But if not, you know, I'm comfortable having different models at, at different schools. Um, I do think we don't need to know this information today, but over uh, looking out over the next three years, you know, the school board set forth a strategic plan that does require greater uh, need for professional development. So we can't say we want you to implement this strategic plan at the same time. We're not going to provide more time for professional development there. You, you can't have one without the other. So. Um, I'll leave it at that. So also, Meredith, it would be helpful to clarify just from my own understanding in terms of where we stand in terms of how much professional development we're able to have, particularly for Pond Cove, because that's the one that's impacting the school calendar and looking at creating trade-offs and what sort of is best practice and where we're trying to move to, because I think that um, in reading other papers about uh, other schools in Maine and across the country in terms of what's funded and what is best practices, professional development has tended to be one of the areas that is highly impactful that is often underfunded. So where do we stand relative to that? I, I would say that we are uh, underfunded. 
Um, I think every district could use additional days for teachers. The, the reality is we have seven days that we pay teachers to do professional development over the course of the year. Um, and you know, if you equate that to, you know, I, I've heard it analogized to equate it to your mechanic or your hairdresser. Um, you know, not that their work is unimportant, it's certainly important, but to stay up to date on the skills, often they're getting five to 10 days a year or more um, to stay current in their field. And, and yet we give educators who are entrusted with the education of our children seven days over the course of the year. Um, right now those are chunked up, some of the three of those days are chunked up into Monday afternoons for an hour and a half at a time, which lends itself to some work um, in sort of team collaborative work, but doesn't lend itself to in-depth exploration of a topic. Um, because of all of the additional requirements that we've had to manage over the last couple of years, such as teacher evaluation, which took up a couple of the days that we've had available to us this year, um, as well as changing state standards. Um, those days have been, um, there haven't been enough of them to cover all of the things that we need to cover. And you do, you do make up those costs one way or another, right? You, may, you pay for it by not doing as well on a standardized assessment because teachers haven't had time to really wrestle with the standards and make the curricular changes that they need to make. You pay for it in, um, in this case, you know, lost sort of instructional time to do that work. So there are trade-offs, but I would say that we are underfunded, but everyone else is too. <laughs> Well, I'm mostly concerned about I know us that. and how. So am I. And so, in, but in making those trade-offs, we're looking for the ones that are the most impactful, and so that's why it was relative to, to understand where we stood to what the impactfulness of that is. So, um, and then another question back to you. So it sounds like what you're actually saying is, in terms of some of the early release days, you have a potential that you're developing so that you can handle the professional development needs but not actually change the calendar for the early release. Is that accurate? Or less, change it less? So I, in terms I, of working with the high school? Or so I think that it would still be early release. What she's, the proposal that Kelly and Jeff have briefly discussed is providing alternative childcare opportunities so for family. So it's an optional continuation of the existing calendar or an optional? Yes, but it wouldn't, wouldn't be, be regular instruction. With right, the right, right, I understand. But most of the issue was a, that I saw was around timing. There was some that had to do with instruction time, but that's, again, that's the impactfulness trade-off versus the calendar trade-off. So this so, sounds like we're able to minimize some of the, the calendar impact trade-off. Potentially some of the impact, to, I would characterize it as the impact of families around needing to find alternative child care. Okay. So we'll be voting on this later in the meeting. That was my question. Um, I feel like there's a lot I have to say about this, and I'm, I'm happy to wait. Um, and I don't know if other people need to weigh in on this. Um, but I feel like we've gotten some communication about it and move on when we, uh, we're going to um, make a motion and have discussion and either amend it or say no, and we need to talk, you know, we need to take this off and bring it back another time. So, do people feel comfortable moving on? Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. So, on to item D, administrator's strategic plan updates. And it's like they're flipping coins out there to see who. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm gonna capitalize on, on having um, Jonathan and Amanda here, um, and I thank you for staying a bit a bit longer than perhaps you, you had intended. But I did want to talk about technology tonight and uh, integration of technology, and whether integration is the right word, or we're talking about immersion in technology, learning with technology, or learning through technology. Um, although they're they're words, I think they have different connotations for how we're looking to um, utilize technology. And um, with the presence of the iPads that we have at the level that we have, um, with, this, with the support of our technology director, Noel Karoff, our technicians, Jack Duffy, Jason Lund, Matthew Young, and of course our, our LITs, Jonathan and, and Amanda, um, at this stage we um, have 
available to us um, a device for every student in the middle school. And so the vision of, of having the devices utilized well and to really use them to promote and enhance the learning that's going on for those 21st century skills um, requires that we are mindful about using them well. And so are we preparing students to, to really use um, the iPads, in this case, as, as the device that, that we have, to, to do them well? Um, what you heard a little bit about was the idea lab, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a little more detail in a minute, but really this focus on how can we develop the technology proficiencies in our students um, using these iPads, and so far we're starting to already see an increase in fifth and sixth grades in requests to um, have the Apple TVs so students can showcase their work in the classroom, so we're um, adding uh, more of those devices to the to the fifth grade on request and our sixth grade science teachers have already asked for those devices in addition to explain everything apps as well as as notability so um, having the having the iPads and having teachers request these things but also seeking the support um, and and professional development around how can we use this to enrich our learning is and teaching is where where our lits do come in I want to credit Doug Purley, our assistant principal, for conceiving of this idea uh, around the Idea Lab, um, not only for all the work, excellent work he did on developing our master schedule with our scheduling committee at the middle school, but coming up with this idea for how can we use time in fifth and sixth grade really well that's opposite our world language block to promote um, this idea of building technology proficiencies in addition to some of the other things that we do. So, Doug conceives of Idea Lab, reaches out to our, our lits, and um, off we go. And we have this great kind of emerging model of, of things that are happening and great things that um, John, I invite Jonathan Amanda to come back up and, and talk to you much better uh, than I can. Um, and they will do it with more enthusiasm <laughs> as well. Not that I'm not enthusiastic, but they're just they're so bubbly and dynamic um, that I would love to have them talk to you about some of the great things happening in fifth and sixth grade idea labs. So thank you. Sure. Um, so we try to collect data um, frequently about the work that students are doing. So I just pulled together uh, a snapshot from today's, but we use a form through Google Forms. And um, this will show you a snapshot of what was happening today in idea lab. Um, the first will show you the project categories that we suggested um, to all students as they began to tell us the kinds of work they wanted to do. And then the next one will show you within that, those that have selected independent projects, what they want to do. And then finally, um, if they're working on A, what else they've been working on recently. So this is not yet project categories. There it is. So this is the kind of things they were doing. Um, Amanda mentioned the cardboard challenge. Um, we're working on decoration around things like student projects, and many of these will overlap. Um, murals and, and painting in the building that represent um, activities that are going on. Uh, digital citizenship work. A lot of students really interested in cyberbullying, um, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second, or preventing yes. cyberbullying. They're not interested in it. Um, <clears throat> displays and posters throughout the building. And then of the last one, independent projects. Um, we have these students who are working on a hopscotch app, video, um, writing, and then you can see also the book projects, um, something we call shelfies, where the students will take a picture of themselves with the book they're reading, and then um, put kind of a thought bubble over their head to give us a recommendation that um, their other students can see what they're reading. Um, and also book trailers, like what um, Carolyn discussed at the high school. And then this will give you a sense, too, of the other work they're doing. So if they've declared today that they're doing A, these are the other things they're working on. So hopefully that gives you something a little more concrete. Um, Amanda said, you know, we're working with their, we're trying to follow their inspiration as much as possible. But um, we've also tried to give them some more structure as we discover sometimes sixth graders need a little more focus than we might have otherwise right. imagined. Right. Um, so this has been our attempt to kind of give a little more um, direction to and circumscribe some of that work so we know what exactly they're doing. 
So these are examples of what the students work on. Um, but again, going back to some of the bigger themes that we've been fortunate enough to talk to seventh and eighth graders a little bit more about this year as well. Um, again, the guiding principles. It's in the seventh grade, we have the CAPER Award that you probably remember. Um, and there are some really great defining qualities um, uh, for what a CAPER, what a great CAPER student would be. Um, as well as the guiding principles. And I think it's important to note that what, we're, what we are creating, as Jonathan describes, we have, we have to put a bit of a boundary and a structure on their creativity. We can't just have boundless creativity and creation in, in the LLC. It would be even messier than it <laughs> is now. Um, so we have to put some structure to it. And when we think about how that, what they're doing fits into some categories and um, what what they're really experiencing and um, developing are related to communication and collaboration. Most definitely, they work together, they work independently, they change, they change their groupings and they're able to share work. Um, they work, we encourage that they are being very responsible about their use, not just with iPads, but of you know, library materials, of, you know, other, of other students' works. Um, we encourage a lot of um, creative problem solving. Um, a lot of, you might see something you know, listed as um, you know, filling out a Google form. It's surprisingly difficult for a student with an iPad to just follow a link to a Google form that requires them to log into their Google account first. And if Safari has it, you know, a cached memory of some other user's account, it's surprisingly difficult to do that. And what we see um, when we talk about technology in particular, um, having suddenly iPads in every fifth and sixth grade classroom with parent, uh, teachers who didn't necessarily have the familiarity with them and how to integrate them into their classroom, we have been able to take on those messy challenges, the ones where you say, well, I know, it, I know it can show up and drive, I just don't know how to get it there. Let's spend 10 minutes problem solving. Um, what we are, to use, borrow um, Jonathan's um, uh, powerful word choice, what we are affording these students is the chance to really be critical problem solvers, um, creative, innovative, um, and collaborative. Um, and we see in doing that that we're solving, in lots of little ways, we're solving a lot of our tech, uh, the lot of gaps, gaps that we had in, in technology proficiency. Students are most definitely, as Carolyn said, they are all born in the digital age. It is absolutely a part of every element of their life, but it doesn't mean their skill, it doesn't mean their experience with the kinds of apps and performances that we want at, in school. Um, they still need instruction. They need that creativity and that um, permission to encouragement to take some risks, but within a safe environment, within, you know, with a guide and a facilitator that can help them and, um, encourage mindset, for example, and, and you know, talk about being flexible versus you know, the student today that said, well, this didn't work. Do I have your permission to just quit? And we both, oh my gosh, did we just fail? Have we failed everything? And they said, haha, just kidding. I get it. That would be a fixed mindset. Um, but that's the sort of shift that really we see happening um, and that we feel is essential to integrating technology. It's not enough to say that the iPad is. Um, engaging and fascinating and so high tech and exciting, they, they really have to feel, um, yeah, they have to feel like they're able to, they, they have some control and some permission to mess around and, um, you know, the opportunity to really succeed and figure stuff out. And we're seeing students in fifth and sixth grade take the lead in the classrooms on how to use the iPads. I was going to say to that end, um, so Mike doesn't regret giving us the mic, I'll show you three more things. This is the form that you just saw the results from, designed by students in Idea Lab. We put out the problem, we need to track the work you're doing. This group of seven students over the course of a week and a half figured out how to use the laptops to create the form, how to collect the data over and over again. That's not what I meant. Yeah. Like, you know, subpages and subpages. And watching them, it was like, I wish I we had videoed, videoed it. Um, no, that's not what I meant, do this, and they go back and they're working in Google Forms, you can collaborate to do it. So there are multiple computers doing this simultaneously, and it was really exciting to see. 
We also have it mentioned uh, also through some pretty wonderful support from the seventh grade team. Because the seventh grade students are asked to present at their parent conferences with portfolios, we've had the opportunity to see, and this is a very extended rotation, but every Tuesday we see two of the advisory groups. And that's allowed us to talk about how our sensibility about portfolios maps onto the main guiding principles and how they can begin to collect information that would be helpful to share, not just with their parents, but as we look at um, standards and proficiency-based grading, what is it going to look like to demonstrate your growth? And I give them the example that it's not a very exciting um, time-lapse uh, film to see the seed and the full plant, that we want to see those steps along the way. And please, please, please do not delete your drafts. We want to see how you're growing as a student. And then finally, um, we talked briefly about Twitter, which I'm infamous for. But um, I had the opportunity to work with a group of people who, um, and Mike may mention this, as we developed uh, the makerspace in response to this amazing support from the CIF grant, I put out these ideas about what we were proposing to my PLN, my professional learning network, and um, gave them some ideas about the kinds of things we wanted to do in there. And in response, put together um, a feedback document, and this probably doesn't mean too much until you get down far enough. So these are people in my PLN commenting on our proposed plan. And then this, which is Maker Education International, commenting on our Makerspace proposal. Even I was astounded that they were weighing in on this. But because I had infamously hashtag Makerspaces, put that in, it was picked up by a number of different people. And we have over two dozen comments here helping us understand how we might refine our work. Um, and really lovely comments as, as well, saying, you know, I really think your planning is fantastic. And this opportunity now to create a locus, a second locus for that kind of creativity. I think it's possible Amanda mentioned communication twice. Um, that the creativity piece of it is really, we're hoping will be afforded by that new space, which we're in the process of pulling together. And Laura Ellis has been fantastic in helping us do that. Excellent. Thank you both. I think the last point I would just want to make is the power that we're seeing of um, wondering, thinking of why not, but putting problems out to students and then getting out of their way and just continually being amazed with what they do and what they come up with when they're not waiting for us or being held back or necessarily um, guiding themselves within a structure. We're saying, here's what we want to try to figure out what we're wondering about and then we get out of their way and having the support of, of great people with great knowledge and um, really I think we're seeing really engaged, lively, um, pretty fired up students about what they're doing. So that's our, our presentation on technology. So questions? technology. <laughs> Barbara, um, just a quick question, Mike. And having been able to hear an enthusiastic presentation twice now, my time on the board, my um, and it's all incredibly exciting what's happening in the Library Learning Commons. But talk to us a little bit about the impact of this work on the rest of the school. And I'm hearing seventh grade team asks for help with portfolios, but I'm not hearing. English department is, in, is now engaged in some of these different strategies, or the social studies have found different ways to, so, so how, how is this impacting the school as a whole in terms of student engagement and bringing some of this energy into other classrooms we're not hearing about? I think it's, it's really about, uh, with the reconceptualization of, of you know, a library to a learning commons, helping people to understand how our lits are a resource and the kinds of things that they can help you with. So it's um, no longer are we looking at as, as a time where you just bring your class to the LLC and John and Amanda can do a presentation on a topic of interest and, and that's always available. What we're seeing is more and more teachers reaching out saying, here's what we're learning about, here are the standards, um, here's what we're trying to accomplish, what do you think? So. Um, we do see increasing numbers of teachers come, not only coming to the LLC but saying, oh, Jonathan or Amanda, can you come to my class on this day and help me talk to the class about so that idea of we're trying, continually trying to empower teachers. So 
there are so many different examples of, of different pieces that are happening, um, and, and you feel free to come back if you want to highlight particular areas. You know, Jonathan referenced earlier an Egypt project that is, is, is now being done in collaboration with the LLC that wasn't done in the past. That's a sixth grade project. Um, eighth grade, um, eighth grade teams really looking at some of the Google Doc, Google Classroom work that's going on. Meredith, I see you trying to jump in. Well, I was just going to say that I think for seventh and eighth grade, the, the challenge that we faced was sort of shifting from, okay, we've always had laptops to how do we do some of the things we've always done with iPads. And so that's, there's been a learning curve with that. And we've had to make some shifts in tools that we're using. Mm -hmm. um, students, I think, have adapted relatively quickly to that. I think the real difference has been largely at fifth and sixth grade where there were sort of floating laptop parts that were marginally accessible, used largely for word processing, occasionally some spreadsheet action to now we're seeing really sort of creative, transformative student build, students building projects through the through these tools or with the use of these tools. And Amanda and Jonathan are really serving to sort of provide those foundational skills for our fifth and sixth graders who haven't had one-to-one -one technology access at the elementary level. Um, but I think a as we see students moving up from the elementary school who have had the benefit of working with Tom Charltre and the teachers at Pond Cove, that need will be diminished and they'll be able to do even much more really curriculum integrated work. That's my at the, at the risk of oversimplifying, um, <laughs> I, so much of what we accomplish I believe is because of our attitude about technology, um, when the original, the first year that there's the iPads appeared in the middle school, um, we were responsible for integrating the iPads, and yet we were we were working with teachers and parents and students who were either completely overwhelmed and confused by it or terrified of it, and what we're trying to model, and we were, a, you know, a little terrified of it too, to be honest. Um, but what we've tried to model more than anything is this acceptance of, um, again, that growth mindset. Okay, well, that didn't work in that app. How could I do that? Or how could I move it from here to there? How could I? Um, and so what we see with seventh and eighth grade um, is not just that collaborative co-teaching, but a teacher who s recognizes that that's a part of a, the unit that is that's where the tech piece comes in, and this is where the, the flexible mindset you know, problem solver comes in, and this is where Jonathan or Amanda needs to be available. Whether the students are just working in the library and we're there with them, or we're in the class giving direct instruction, whatever the model is, um, I, I feel like that's where we're making a great impact. Um, and what, even though we don't teach directly um, on a, on a consistent schedule like the fifth and sixth grade idea lab. Um, we don't see the seventh and eighth graders as consistently. Um, we see more and more students arriving to the library in lots of different, you know, from lots of different classes and seeking that kind of input from us. And um, I think yeah. also for us, um, we've seen, a, I mentioned Jeff and Meredith just said um, that as Tom sends them up into fifth grade, now our eighth graders are entering, and Jeff and I have talked about this, into ninth grade, and instead of um, they are coming with the expectation, may I use Notability for this? And the teachers, instead of coming and saying, this doesn't seem to have a keyboard, they say, can you teach me how to use Notability so I can support my students? And that's a wonderful shift that's beginning to happen through our softwares and through our current software class who have had the iPads in middle school. And I think as a piece of that as well, if you take a look at kpeteam.org, um, Jeff gave me the opportunity to teach a class at the high school so every first period, I have a group of students, and I'm on my fourth semester rotation now. They have created the support for Google Apps for Education, uh, tutorials, the apps that were connected to coding, and the coding event that Tom and I organized, um, Tom, I should say, primarily, um, and the ways in which that has become the KP team student tech support has become a place that both teachers and students look for additional information. So I think one of the things we talked a lot about in re redesigning our space at the middle school was to shift from tech destinations to tech-infused learning. And I think that's what we're seeing, that the iPads are mobile. And so we are supporting a constant stream of teachers and students. And as an example, um, a specific example, Chris Moniz in seventh grade had them do this remarkable project, but she demanded that it all be digital. 
And when students come to you and are like, this old crone is telling me I have to do it visually, <laughs> it's hilarious to watch their sort of like concern about this. And then, you know, Chris would be like, who are you calling an old crone? But it's this hilarious dialogue that takes place. And then they come in and like, I need to insert a video. What do I do? Or uh, Ruthann just reminded me that Tom and Danny Kuhner, so Tom at Pond Cove and Danny, who teaches seventh grade, collaborated to show students mystery Skype. So this is where you don't know the students you're speaking with in another place, and you ask each other um, yes, no questions to try to determine where the other group is. And it's teaching ge geography, it's teaching presentation skills, and it is hilarious to watch. And the, the excitement about, they're west of the Mississippi, yes, they're west of the Mississippi. <laughs> that level of engagement <laughs> using the technology would only be possible there. Yeah. But then fourth graders are doing this already and showing seventh graders, Psh, come on, I'll show you how to mystery yeah. Skype. Yeah. Um, there was a certain Neto child who, for example, said in the fourth grade e team the other day, um, I really think this would be much clearer if we organized it using a Venn diagram. And Tom and I are like, and we're done. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so that sensibility about they're seeing it everywhere, not just um, as a place to go, but uh, a supporting tool that is not separate from but integral to their teaching and learning. That's a really fantastic shift to be able to witness. And some of my straddling has allowed me to see that happen. I like that infusion word. That's a, that's a good goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next. <laughs> Appears to be Principal Shea. So I'll try to keep <coughs> somewhat close to the energy level of um, <laughs> Jonathan and Amanda, uh, but on a somewhat drier topic, um, although exciting if you look at it through the right lens. So this is the NIASC visit, um, yes. which is happening from March 13th to March 16th. Um, so. Okay, so this is just a primer. Um, most of you have probably not been through this process before. Elizabeth may have been in her other, uh, other aspects of her educational career. But um, so, <clears throat> so I thought I would just lay out some really basic things. First of all, NUYESC is our accreditation agency. It accredits universities, colleges, private schools, public schools throughout New England. Um, and it has been doing, doing so for a long time. It's based in Massachusetts. And every one of its accreditation commissions has a set of standards. I think it was at the last board meeting that I passed out uh, a file folder that had, among other things, the standards. Mm -hmm. I think that the new board members may not have been here when I did that. I, no, that was last here. meeting. They were yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I couldn't remember that. So anyway, so somewhere in your archives, you have the standards. So I'm not going to go over those. Um, what happens is every 10 years, every school which is seeking accreditation hosts a visiting team. And we are hosting a visiting team from Sunday, March 13th through Wednesday, March 16th. One of the things I want to stress is that all of the people who come to the school, they are not employees of NIASC. They are volunteer educators from across New England who answer a call to join a visiting team. And so NIASC is really supported by sort of a core of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers who every year um, choose to go out to, visiting school, to visit schools. There are seven standards for accreditation. There are two members of each of the visiting team who are assigned to sort of become specialists in each one of those standards. So there are 14 members of the team who have special responsibility for one of the standards. And they, there are partners, so they help one another. Then there is an assistant chair of the committee and a chair of the committee. 
They are also not employees of NEASC. So we have 16 people who are going to be visiting us. Um, we just heard um, Andrew Lupian is acting as the steering committee chair. So he has been sort of an overall charge of the self-study process. Just last week, we heard from and learned who was going to be our visiting committee chair. Uh, it's a gentleman named Peter Brown, who is from Maine. Um, he's now retired. He was the principal at J. Maine for a number of years. And before that, he worked in the Sacopee Valley School System and probably some others that I'm not aware of yet as well. So the purpose of, the, of, the, of the, these 16 folks is they are going to be starting with self-study materials that we, our staff, has been working on and gathering for the last year and a half. And basically, the mission of the team is to come and to verify that our self-study accurately reports our strengths and weaknesses, that we've identified those things, or where they, are think, they think there are things we have missed, um, either in terms of things that should be commended or things that should be recommended to bring those to our attention. So, basically what happens is for three and a half days, we have a very intensive experience and the visiting team members have an even more intensive experience where they are essentially working from about six o'clock in the morning, oftentimes till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. They come, they visit us, they have lots and lots and lots of meetings with all kinds of different groups. And a lot of those meetings are scheduled and a lot of the meetings are just things that because of the needs, the responsibilities that they have, just on the spur of the moment, they say, Jeff, I need to meet with you or I need to meet with the guidance counselors or I need to meet with a school nurse. We're continually, continually gathering information. So over the course of the three and a half days, they are gathering all this information and they are writing the reports at the same time, their reports, which are largely based on our reports, but um, in, and in most cases will overlap at least, but in some cases they may be adding some new information. So our self-study report was completed finally about two weeks ago. I shared it with Meredith. I'm not sure if it's been shared with the board yet or not. Yes? I, I believe so. I believe Andrea sent it out, but if you haven't received it, we will make sure that she does. Okay. I will put a link to it on the school website as well, so it will be available through, through the school website as well. Um, okay. So that's that. So all of our professional staff members have been involved in this process for the last 18 months. We are also very grateful to a small group of volunteer parents who, who, who accepted the draft, volunteered to be commenters on our draft as we went forward. Um, so we were, there were about seven or eight parents who gave us wonderfully helpful comments on each one of, our self, uh, on each one of the, the areas of our self-study committee reports. And so that was wonderful. We did organize a small cadre of students to do the same thing but it's really tedious work and they had better things to do. Um, so we didn't get a lot of student input, uh, but we had, we're, I'm very confident that we have a real good, good uh, self-study. So I wanna get into the logistics. So the report, the self-study again is March 13th, or the group, the visit is March 13th to March 16th. The group is staying by the Inn by the Sea. Now, I will qualify that by saying, we always make sure that ourselves, as much as we have influence over it, we always try to make sure that our, self, our committee visit is during mud season. And the Inn by the Sea is very generous during mud season in sort of giving really, 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 really good deals. Um, so it is costing us no more to put these folks up at the Inn by the Sea than we put them out at a small airport down near the main mall. Um, but they will get very nice and very close accommodations. So we're very grateful to the Inn by the Sea. So I've listed a whole bunch of bullet points that sort of give you a flavor of what the, all the different things that the visiting team members will be doing, the type of people that will be visiting, and, and it's lots of people, including school board members, which I think I mentioned at the last meeting. So now we have a few more details that I want to add to you. So there's a section that says, when and where is the school board involved, um, if you're following that. So the major involvement is on Sunday afternoon, so it's the afternoon of the, of the first visit day. It always starts on a Sunday. <clears throat> From 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m., there is a panel presentation, which will be in the cafeteria. There will be students and teachers who will be highlighting sort of 
themes that we found about ourselves in terms of both things we think we do well and things that we think we need to do better. Um, so that's 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. Then there is a meeting specifically for the school board from 3.10 to 3.40 for as many of you as can make it at that time. Sunday, March 13th, 3.10 to 3.40. That's room 216 in Angela Schapani's room on the second floor. Then, um, also later in that afternoon, from 4.55 to 5.45 in the high school library, um, there is a welcoming reception where the visiting team members will introduce themselves to us. Um, and there will also be, I think that will be the occasion when probably uh, the superintendent will welcome the committee and if, if, if you can make it, Elizabeth, where you, could, you can sort of, um, on, the, as on behalf of the school board, sort of welcome the committee as well. Then on, Mar on Wednesday, March 16th, the very last thing before the visiting team members depart after three and a half intensive days at the high school um, is the, the chair, Mr. Brown, will give some very brief overview remarks that's going to be happening in the high school library from 2.30 to 2.45. It is by no means a comprehensive sort of statement. It's just really some very big highlighted bullet, bullet points that we can expect to see. So if there are any of you who are able to make that or interested in making that, that's certainly something we'd be more than glad to have you there for. <coughs> so what do we expect we will find? Um, you will get um, the entire self-study. It's almost 100 pages. You can look at it at your leisure. And I just wanted to give you two aspects of the report that you will find in the self-study. They're actually the last several pages of the self-study. Basically what it says is it says to the high school faculty, tell us what you think from your work comparing what you found about the high school to the NIAS standards. Where do you think you, have, you are particularly strong and where do you think that there are particular needs? Um, so, and then what they have done is they've asked us, based on particularly the critical needs, what are the two-year and five-year projections, sort of things, ways that you would like to move the school forward? So I want to give these to you. I'm not going to go over them in great detail. You can look at leisure. I'll just highlight a couple things. Jeff, this is just for high school, correct? Right. Okay. There is, accreditation is also available for middle schools, and I think in elementary schools, a very tiny percent of the schools or school districts do it to that. Largely private, but it's very cost prohibitive. Yeah, I think that, I think that's true. Somebody in my head, oh no, no, oh no, I did hold on to it. So the thing that I want to point out again, I'm not going to go at all through any of these. The thing that above all, I want to prepare the board that we're going to be criticized for this. And I know it, <laughs> and we deserve it, and we will do the work that we need to do. But one of the things that NIAS asks you to do is in the school mission statement, which I think I also gave, gave, gave a copy to you last time. You've seen it before, you've approved it. On the, on the back side of the school mission statement are what are called 21st century learning expectations. Those are sort of the cross-cutting academic skills and then the civic and social expectations that we, by the time our students graduate, we hope to see that our students are demonstrating. One of the NIAS standards, which is repeated again and again and again in the standards, is to have school-wide rubrics by which a school measures progress against those cross-cutting expectations. We do not have those in place yet. We do not. Um, and we will, they will tell us, we have told ourselves we need to do that. Um, they will tell us we need to do that. There's no doubt about it. We need to do that. We did make a tactical decision not to not to push those things to the very forefront because we decided as a staff um, that we had a lot of things on our plate 
connected to the move towards the common core, proficiency-based diplomas, differentiation, the NIAS process itself, and other things. So we decided that we were going to prioritize some other things that are really the, the, the foundational work that will make the school-wide rubrics much more meaningful and authentic and actually have a chance to actually last and persist because too many schools, including Cape Elizabeth High School, the last time we went through this process, rushes through the process of creating a school-wide rubric. They don't really take root um, and they don't, be, they don't really affect kids' education that well. Um, so what we decided to do, we decided we really needed to focus on, on developing written curriculum that would take us in the direction of, which would be the foundation for our professional learning community work, our differentiation work, and proficiency-based diplomas. So we have been putting an awful lot of effort into that. We've been putting an awful lot of effort into developing much greater commonality of assessments, which are all still also connected to very much the NIAS standards. We have not yet done the school-wide rubric part of it, and they will tell us that. And we have told them that tell us that. They should, to tell us that. So it won't be a surprise. Um, you will also see throughout here, particularly in the two-year fi and five-year plans, you will see, I think, represented a tremendous amount of overlap with the strategic plan, tremendous amount of overlap with the sort of driving values of community, academics, passion, ethics. You will see things targeted at issues like stress management um, and some other things that won't be news to the board at all. So I think I will leave it there. If anybody has any questions at this point, I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions. A couple of questions. Um, it seems like a lot of this work really jives with the work that we've been doing with the strategic plan. Yes. Has it helped crystallize the strategic plan, or are, is this one of those you're going to go back and look at the strategic plan and say there's room for improvement based on what we've learned? It, it really, it, 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 the process went both ways. Um, so the strategic plan, I would say most concretely the strategic plan helped us to be much clearer in our own thinking about how we can accomplish some of the standards, um, specifically around interdisciplinary learning and helping kids um, figure out really practical ways to help students explore areas that they were deeply interested in themselves. Uh, that's what I would say is the most direct connection between the strategic plan and, and this. The strategic plan obviously takes us in other ways as well in terms of looking at school climate, the Wessler work and all that sort of stuff. That's not specifically named here, but it is very much, when you get into the actual self-study report, you'll see it's talked about in, in, in great detail. Um, and I really do think when you, when you put the strategic plan and these two and five year plans, which are just different formats for the same thing, you will see, I believe, about 90% overlap between the two things. So I think they, they dovetail tail really nicely. One of the reasons we chose not to do, put as much emphasis um, on the move towards school-wide rubrics is because that is, n that is not necessarily something that's connected to either being a professional learning community or doing differentiation or accomplishing the objectives of the strategic plan. It is good work. We will do it. But we tried to focus more deliberately, got given all the things that we had on our plates to say, what's at the center? What's, what's the really overlapping stuff? I clearly understood the need to prioritize when there's only, last I checked, 24 hours. Yep. in a day and you have to sleep at some point. Um, you mentioned earlier that there are volunteers from all other districts who come to these site visits. Do you know if any of the folks in our district have volunteered to be on site visits? Or yes. Uh, this year, Betsy Nielsen, who's one of our technology teachers, went, I believe, to Yarmouth High School. Um, Andrew Lupian went to a school in the fall. I can't remember which one it was. <coughs> I went to uh, Green New Gloucester High School last year. <coughs> um, Wynn Phillips went somewhere last year as well. So very commonly what happens as <coughs> this cycle becomes self-perpetuating is that schools who are 
beginning to work on their own self-study process and want to get familiar with what other schools are doing and the standards and those sorts of things very often become the source of volunteers. I will also say, and I didn't mention this, is that what happens from the time the visiting committee writes its report is the next step is the visiting committee report is sent to me and I have an opportunity of, in a fairly compact window of time to make any corrections, to talk to the chair. <clears throat> And then the chair forwards the chair's own sort of thoughts about uh, what ought to be highlighted and that sort of thing to the NIAS commission. Um, and the NIAS commission is also composed of volunteers. It's volunteer principals, um, uh, superintendents, and assistant principals from districts across New England. And that group of people actually has the final say on whether you get <clears throat> Your, you get continued accreditation status, what the progress reports are that you have to, you have to write, and all those, all those sorts of things. That wasn't really directly responsive to your question, mm -hmm. Joe, but I, 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 I meant to, to say that earlier. I love to see how this all yeah. fits into the larger scheme of things. <clears throat> and then one last question that I have is, and I know it's an obvious answer, but I think maybe not for those who might be listening, is what does accreditation status get us? <clears throat> so that's the great... Um, question. And NIAS struggles a lot to figure out what it gets. They would like to say, and there is some truth in saying that colleges pay some attention to it, but the reality is it's not, uh, it's not a be-all and end-all thing in terms of colleges. In other, in, for example, just in the last two or three years, there's some very affluent, high-achieving school districts in Massachusetts that have led a charge <coughs> to take themselves out of the NIAS process. Um, and largely because they found it too prescriptive in some ways. Um, to be honest with you, one of the ways that a lot of schools struggle the most with is the school-wide rubrics and trying to make those authentic and meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a, a discussion at the commission level. Um, really what it gets us, I think, is it gives us an opportunity to reflect on our own practice. It forces us to do that in a systematic way. And much as, you know, you can wonder, is all of the time worth it? One of the things that you, as a staff, you come out with is English teachers know a whole lot more about what goes on in technology and art and math and all it really gives teachers a much bigger bird's eye view of um, how they're doing, regardless of anything that NIASC ultimately says in our report. I would say that's the most fundamental thing. For some communities, what a NIASC report can do is it can actually accelerate um, work that we think is really important or needed. In some communities that have less budgetary support than in Cape Elizabeth, uh, NIAS recommendations can play a critical role in terms of addressing some critical facilities needs, sometimes budgetary needs, sometimes professional development needs, um, and those sorts of things. So, so, so it gives sort of a political impetus as well, I guess, to some needs in, in terms of highlighting um, some issues that, that folks need to be talking about. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi again. I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to bring you back to elementary school. So um, you can really just be thinking about math for a moment. Um, as almost all of you, with the exception of Joe, I think, um, and Barbara, and you too. Um, you've seen our newly revised um, PONCO report card with the revisions for standards-based mathematics um, as a progress key. And so we've done a lot of our professional development around standards-based mathematics to go along with the Common Core state standards. And um, for the benefit of the public, it's really um, looking at what we want students to know and be able to do by the end of a grade level. And so we're, we're where the grading system is a little bit different um, than um, parents are used to seeing, but it starts with NYA, not Yar North Yarmouth Academy, but not yet assessed. 
Um, one is beginning, two is working towards the target, three is meeting a target, and four is exceeding a target. And that's a little different than what the report card had, has been in, in, and currently is in the other academic areas. So um, our Director of Instruction, Ruth Allen Vaughan, um, has been working really hard to um, it have, she's been in, in connection with somebody that the two of us met this summer um, at the University of Chicago when Meredith sent us out there um, to a train the trainer um, conference for, for the new fourth edition of Everyday Math. And um, we met Professor Jean, and I've spoken about her before, I believe, um, Professor Gina Kling from um, the Western Michigan University, who, and she also consults with the University of Chicago's elementary mathematical and science education um, program. And she's going to be coming um, to us, and depending on weather things, conditions and things, or Skyping, um, to work with us on fact fluency. She's the real guru, really nationwide, on fact fluency. And um, one of the most important concepts for children to learn in mathematics, um, as you probably know, is really developing automaticity to learn their, their, the four operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And so what she's really going to be working with us on, and we've been doing some of this work anyway because it's already embedded, obviously, in our math program, but is really building that fact fluency so students beca can become efficient and accurate and really have that on the spot automaticity. But part of that goes along with that continuum of learning K4 and understanding the phases of learning fact fluency. And so like just starting with, I mean, again, I'm going to be brief, but just think of very, very basic and at the kindergarten level of that, you know, just concrete visual modeling, um, using hands-on manipulatives um, in, the, in the primary grades, but also um, helping the next stage would be like using reasoning strategies. So like if you're looking at, um, Say the first the first step might at the concrete level would be say it's um, five plus eight, and they might be you, you'll see them counting on fingers or using um, counters to do it. Whereas the next one, five plus eight, what are the reasoning strategies you want them to learn? So they might say, oh five, well, five plus five is ten, and three more that's thirteen, and so and then ultimately getting them to the to the next phase of um, mastery and proficiency. Whereas they just five five plus eight is thirteen, and you ask, how did you get that? I just knew, because that's what happens. Okay, and so already there's there's all kinds of things I could go on, but I won't right now. But um, so that's um, we're excited. She's coming for our early release day on March seventh, and um, we are hoping weather or planes or um, trains and automobiles, whatever gets her here, um, or we'll we'll be skyping with her. But she's really fantastic, and we're really looking forward to. Um, we really. We were really taken with the work that she did with us. So, any questions? You guys are sick of me, so I'm going to go. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief, but to kind of circle back to the digital, digital citizenship piece. Amanda's right, that is hard to say. A um, couple of things that have been happening across district. I'm going to be reporting to you next time that we meet on our um, metrics for our assessment. But with the digital citizenship piece, we've <coughs> taken a, a bit of a leap with our STAR testing at the middle school this year, middle school in Pond Cove. Um, and rather than deploying the iPads the same way that we've done in the past with NWEA testing, with STAR testing, um, we decided to see if we could use all of the devices that we had without necessarily using the lockdown that we've had in the past. And um, rather than just employing devices that were very tightly controlled and you can take this and do this and we're going to grab it right back from you, which was disruptive for other classes as we took devices from and said this is the only cart we're going to use this for. Um, we said, you know, it's time for us to see what we can do and really embrace the devices that we had. And so we made that leap and I'm happy to say that it went very, very well. Um, and so we've kind of maximized our capabilities in scheduling. Um, so rather than trying to share out carts between 
grade levels and say, okay, now you, this grade level can only test in this window because this cart now needs to move here. As we're moving more toward a one-to-one -one environment with a number of our classrooms, we can say, okay, here's your four-week test window. We have a lot of latitude now. And um, we did find a few challenges at Pond Cove with our network because as we've brought down more iPads and as most adults walking into the building have at least one or two cell phones in a pocket that also ping the network simultaneously, we discovered that we had a few places that we needed to shore up. But we're able to find that out before state testing rolls the end of March into April. So that was a good thing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight, kind of an example of some of the cross grade level, cross building work today, I walked into Sean, uh, Tom Shaltray's room. He had a couple of fourth graders who had been doing some research and they were on a, a vetted search site, ran across something that wasn't horribly inappropriate, but they found a little bit concerning. And so immediately they were looking at it Tom started a Twitter. He quickly, I messaged Jonathan from the high school. Jonathan's at the high school and they're talking about what can we do. The girls were, how do we put this out here and make sure that we can get this taken care of? Because we don't like what we see and we think that others should take care of this. And so immediately they started a, a forum for others to start looking at, is this a problem? How do we want to deal with it? And it was just all in a day's work. It was just the girls t rallying to say, you know, it's not horribly inappropriate, but we still don't think it's good to have to deal with this stuff. So it was an ad that was down in the corner of a National Geographic site. Wasn't horrible, wasn't great. And they said, you know what, we don't like that. What can we do about it? And so it gave them an opportunity right there on the ground to say, what do we have at our disposal to deal with this? And as a message for fourth graders, I think that's great because they're taking control of digital presence and how they impact it. So it's positive. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready to move on, which is me. So at this time, the school board would like to put out a call for um, members for our um, school board advisory screening committee, which we will be actually appointing at the next meeting. So this is the official call for membership. And I would like to explain um, the, the makeup, the role, and responsibilities, and then how people could um, reach out to be a part of this group. So first of all, the makeup of this advisory committee is going to be three school board members, uh, two members of the district leadership team, um, three teachers, which we hope would be one representing each school is the hope, um, two parents, and two community members. And um, so what we hope is that the district leadership team would talk amongst itself and, and put forward the, the two people that they would trust to represent them on that committee. And at the, the same way that we would hope that teachers at the high school, the middle school, and the elementary school would have an opportunity to, again, find, you know, find somebody that they felt would represent them. And that person is willing to do this work. So it's, it's not, um, the board isn't going to say, you know, tapping shoulders, we want you. We would like that to come from, you know, each of those groups. Um, as far as parents and community members, we would love for interested people to email. And at this moment, I will be the recipient of those emails and will make my email available in the um, board notes and, and on the district website. Um, and an application very simply just to say number one why are you applying and number two what skills and talents would you bring to this work and number three if you could list any previous service to the district that would be really helpful um, the role of the advisory screening committee is 
to advise the board. The, there will be a mandatory training. There will be an opportunity to read incoming applications. Then um, the committee will numerically rank those applications and finally make recommendations to the board. Um, I cannot stress enough the responsibilities of this committee around confidentiality and we will have a lot of training about this. So as, as you think about anybody thinking about this, um, there, are, there are some time commitments as far as you know, training and time when, when we need to get together and do this ranking work and also really bearing in mind the confidentiality around this process. So um, I will state again, my, I'm the one taking applications at this time. Um, it's elizabeth.cyphries at gmail.com and spelling cyphries is never fun, so please try to <laughs> find it on the website. Mary, just um, two questions that I think might help. Um, deadline for people to apply? Yes. So we, are, we, I think it would be great to hear before our March business meeting, which is March 8th, March 8th because we will be <laughs> appointing the committee that evening. So, um, I feel like we need to, I, I didn't think ahead, I apologize. No, 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 I, I mean, would you like to, would March 1st give you adequate time? I think time? March 1st is fair, thank you. Yeah, okay. March 1st. Um, and then the other question was, when do you anticipate the training and the application review to begin, just so people know when their service commitment might start? Great. So um, on our newly formed um, superintendent search website, there's a timeline. Um, I can say right now that it looks like af the application closing date is March 8th. And so that work will begin r after, right after March 8th, uh, March 8th and be in that early to middle part of March. Um, I hesitate to get a lot more specific at this time, but it's going to be probably the middle part of March. Um, and Elizabeth, how about to, uh, just giving a ballpark for that committee's, that advisory committee's um, commitment time? So, like from from sometime in mid March till. Um, I, I would imagine that it would not be more than a week or two, okay. because we are we're looking at the um, the likelihood of possibly accessing applications online as opposed to having to have paper applications so that might help us with our process but it's it's not it's not a huge long time commitment and then maybe just to um, uh, explain what happens after that um, that point with that committee so after that committee makes its recommendation to the school board the school board um, hiring committee will be conducting all interviews um, the advisory screening committee will not be a part of any interviews. Um, this, so its service will be done at that time. And are there any other questions? Great. So moving on to item F, budget calendar. Yes. So in your packets, I believe again, and published on our website, is a proposed calendar for the 2017 fiscal year budget. You will note that no longer on our calendar and pursuant to a vote later this evening, but following up on a town council vote from last evening, we have removed the community services portion um, that has previously been part of our budget process from our calendar. That said, um, and this is the first time the board and, in fact, the administrative team are hearing this, um, given the recent challenges um, that we, are, we learned of with our budget, I, and that we aren't dealing with community services budget, I would ask the board to just consider whether or not it might be willing to delay the start of our budget process to March 1st. Um, we learned of the million dollar shortfall, and I'll elaborate on that, a little bit later, or the potential million dollar shortfall um, a week ago last Friday. 
I met with faculty in each of the schools and building principals today um, for the first time to really talk about that because it was the first faculty meeting scheduled in, those, in the schools since then. Um, because we are on vacation next week, the opportunity for input and some decision making around how we best handle um, that shortfall and, and the budget piece is tight. Um, you know, certainly right now everyone's expecting that we're going forward with a proposal to you on February 23rd and we will do that if that's the will of the board um, in the interest of sort of thoughtful decision making around what may be some um, difficult issues to wrestle with. If the board was willing to give more time, um, we would certainly welcome that. So again, I, I recognize that's new information for all of you tonight and I certainly respect the calendar that is before us. I'm going to ask Joe to weigh in. Well, my question is for you and for the district leadership team, would, be, would the extra one week be enough time for you to sort of reformulate your thoughts on where the budget lies? I think the challenge that we face is we've sort of had the last week to react to this mm -hmm. issue and next <clears throat> week is a challenge because there's limited staff around to be able to give input and feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, yes, the additional week would make a significant difference. I also recognize that leaves you with less time on the other end. But I think Joe was asking, is it enough time a week? Do you need more than one, a week? I don't Why think you we can afford that? more than no. a week, frankly. Okay. Just well, without the community services taking up the February 23rd meeting, um, perhaps I can at least, by removing that from our schedule, use that time to more thoughtfully go through the, the existing budget and see how those impacts. Take the temperature of the board on that. I mean, that sounds wise. Yeah. That's what's needed. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. So we would not meet on the 23rd, is that right? Okay. Just strike that off the calendar altogether. Okay. I think that does sound prudent. Okay. So let's go ahead with updating that calendar and let's update that um, for the public as well. So we'll get that update out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and with the budget calendar, I will um, include some budgetary information that, again, I'm going to speak about in a little bit. Great. Thank you. I appreciate, by the way, the extra work that that surprise announcement puts not only on the superintendent but the district leadership team and all the way down into the classrooms. That's not easy work in front of you. Thank you. Um, moving on to item 5G, retirements and resignations. So two things happen in February. One is the teachers who have had leaves of absence um, let us know whether or not they intend to return to those positions. Um, and the second is that folks who anticipate retiring at the end of this calendar year, school calendar year, generally give us notice of that. Um, so we've received some of those notices. High school teacher Sarah Steiner has let us know that she will not be returning from her leave of absence. Um, Sarah's been at the high school for eight years and we certainly wish her well. Um, we've also learned that Sally Tamaro, who works in the office at the middle school, um, will be retiring after 22 years of service to the district and that Barbara Cummings at Pond Cove in their front office will be retiring after 30 years of service to the district. And finally, we've um, heard from second grade teacher Lynn Spadinger that she too will be retiring after 12 years of service um, in Cape Elizabeth. So. And so in June, so in June we typically recognize all of our retirees, the board holds Yes, I, I forget that there are new, there are new members people here. Meeting, so new, for the benefit of new members at that time, we speak specifically, um, uh, folks come to speak specifically about those retirees and we recognize them at that time um, with some well wishes and um, the board typically presents those retirees with gifts and we have a reception for them. Thank you. And now item 5H, superintendent's report. Okay. So, I spoke about budget and I think I will start there and I may end there based on how much time we have before us this evening, but a week ago this past Friday, uh, we learned that um, from the preliminary um, 
monies from the state or the preliminary information we receive from the state is that we will receive a million dollar less in state subsidy. Um, and that's due to several factors, but overall the cost of education in Maine has gone up. Property valuation in Maine overall has gone down. Um, so that means that every community is picking up a little bit more of the cost of education. In Cape Elizabeth's case, our local property valuation has also increased, which means that we pick up then more of the share. Um, at the same time, we have a couple of other local variables that have taken place, which is that our enrollment has decreased um, somewhat, but every individual um, counts um, when you look at enrollment and um, state aid. And at the same time that our overall enrollment has declined slightly, so has our enrollment in special <coughs> education. So those pieces all factor into the funding that we receive from the state. Um, there is some discussion in the legislature about potentially adding um, back in. Um, right now, their, the proposal or the discussion is for about $23 million. And this is information that I um, just received late this afternoon. Um, if that were to happen, that would reinstate almost $400,000 of that million dollar total. Um, but it's very early in the legislative process to give any predictions on whether or not that will actually occur. Um, as we experienced last year, sometimes those legislative decisions are made very late in the process and after our budget um, has been out to voters and decisions have been made. So it becomes um, very difficult mm. in those circumstances to react. So um, last Monday, um, the school board and town council met in a joint workshop to talk about budget overall. Um, and the slides for this are online, so I'm not gonna, uh, going to go through them in great detail, but the greatest challenge that school departments face is that their budgets are largely personnel. They are 81% in our case, um, salaries and benefits. That's, that's where most of the money in Cape Elizabeth goes for education, two people. Um, working in our schools. About another 12% uh, is energy, facilities, transportation, and that leaves 7%, that's everything else. All of our supplies, equipment, furniture, our professional development monies, our legal services, our insurance, all of those pieces um, make up about another 7% of the budget. The challenge um, when 80% of your budget is people is that as salaries and benefits increase, so does your budget. Um, in our case, uh, the con contracted salary and benefits increases amount to about a little over a 4% budgetary increase coming out of the gate. That million dollar cut um, in state aid represents about another 4%. So as we start our budget process with no new requests, no added monies for anything else anywhere, we are coming out of the gate at an 8%, slightly over, above an 8% increase to taxpayers. At the same time, our enrollment overall um, is projected to decline only by about 25 students um, across the district. Most of, the, most of that um, decline is projected to be at the high school. Um, with the high school losing roughly 30 students, um, just based on differential between students graduating and the incoming ninth grade class. Um, the middle school will, is, is projected to pick up about 15 additional students from its current numbers, and the elementary school um, is projected to decline by about 10 students. And for those of you who have watched our enrollment history over the last couple of years, um, the elementary enrollment was um, different than projected by groups like planning decisions and by our prior enrollment history. So as we projected forward to next year, we really utilized the past two years as the indicator of, of what we might expect moving forward. Um, so that, that sort of heavily weights potential growth in our elementary school population. And again, that's what we've experienced the past couple of years. So that's the scenario that we're kind of working with at the moment. Um, it, you know, to get to um, the type of reduction as we experienced last year, the town council wanted us to bring forward a 0% um, increase to taxpayers. To get there would have a substantial impact on staffing and programming across the district and would require um, a lot of difficult conversations. Um, I don't expect that we're going to be bringing forward to you a 0% budget at the outset because I don't think we feel that's the responsible thing for us as an administrative team to do as we start this process. Um, certainly the board will be offering us guidance and making decisions along the way, but 
um, that's the scenario, and it's a challenging situation um, at many levels. And you know, we met with faculty in the schools today. We you know made it very clear that everything is on the table, um, from you know simple things like paper <laughs> and how much paper we're buying, and can we do away with printing um, as much as possible in our schools, to things like administrative positions and um, programs and um, co-curricular and athletics. I mean. Uh, Everything is, is a possibility, so um, I, I want the public to understand that. I want people in this room to understand that. Um, you know, it gets challenging. We had a conversation in one of the schools today about what, what happens is that when you're in a, a situation where the budget is that difficult, um, you try to be guided by what's your mission and vision say, what is your strategic plan calling for, you know, what are your pol how do your policies guide you, particularly around um, class size. You try to think strategically as our enrollment continues to decline slightly over the next several years. You know, what, are, what types of um, cuts can be sustained um, long term? You don't want to lop off professional development wholesale for a year because in the long term that's really not going to benefit the district, for example. Um, but, but these are difficult conversations and um, you know, we're, we're going to try to bring you a number that, that we think represents what's in the best interest of kids, um, but we expect that there'll be some continued conversation around the budget. And I'm going to pause to see if there are any questions about budget before we move on, but... I can't help myself. I think it's also important, though, it's, uh, you know, this is a budget for one year where, uh, you know, we don't know what the number will be, but the final number for, for last year was actually the school tax rate decreased. So, um, you know, I would say state funding is volatile year to year, but if you look at it over a two-year basis, that might be a better perspective than um, the year-to-year -year volatility. But I appreciate the need to lay out the, 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 the headwinds or the, uh, you know, um, but, you know, it's, it, you know, the tax rate for the schools did decline this year. That's right. Just so uh, citizens know that if it increases, you know, if you look, you know, last year it, it, it declined. So I think, you know, once the budget vote's usually done, people move on, but um, actually the tax rate for the schools for this current budget year declined from the prior year. So if it increases, part of that is just because we got more state funding for this year and that same amount of state funding we may lose for, for the upcoming budget year. So we'll have more to share on that, I imagine. Yeah. We did, in fact, realize a 2.1% budget reduction this year and for the school um, portion of the budget. And so that is important to note. And that, that is due in part to, as we talked about, that sort of changing model of the state added money at the 11th hour last year, but after our budget had already been passed. So that extra 400 and extra. $450,000 that came from the state with the additional appropriation for state aid was returned to taxpayers. Um, so I would agree with you, Michael, that as we look sort of budget to budget, that really wasn't part, that, those monies weren't really part of our budget as we moved into this fiscal year, but they did have an impact to taxpayers. And so as we start our budget, it's that 450000 maybe doesn't play into our budgeting process, but it certainly plays, in, plays into the impact on, it, on the taxpayer. Moving on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I just want to commend um, Noel Haroff and Greg Marles, who are our technology coordinator and F transportation and facilities director, um, for their work with the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, both Noel and Greg work for both the town and school department and had a very busy um, last month in kind of getting down to the wire with making sure things were ready to open. And I appreciate their work and the work of their teams. In, um, helping to produce a great opening um, in a beautiful space that has been well visited by the schools already and you'll see student artwork and tomorrow I think the middle school publication studio is um, sharing some work at the library as well. We have three presidential scholar nominees um, in Cape Elizabeth and one of them happens to be represented here. Um, Natalie Vaughn, Will Steidel and Jasper Hansel were all nominated um, for presidential scholar recognition and I um, just want to congratulate Natalie in person but um, <laughs> Will and Jasper as well for that recognition. We are we have begun the special ed director interviewing process. Um, we expect to do second round interviews for that position after the vacation. 
Our taxi school students are visiting students from India. Uh, will be leaving us this week, so I want to um, thank them again for sharing um, their voices with us and helping us learn more about them and their culture as they, I know, learned a great deal from us as well. And our thanks again to Dr. Perez for her um, work in coordinating that visit and partnership. And we hope it's one that we will continue to um, build on moving forward. School vacation starts um, this Friday. So we hope everyone enjoys their time away and returns healthier and rested. Um, we have an early release this Friday afternoon that has been coordinated by the Evaluation Steering Committee that is focused around assessment literacy and Anita Stewart McCafferty and Jeff Beaudry from the University of Southern Maine are coming to work with faculty across the district um, in preparation for some of the additional work around the evaluation system. And I just briefly wanted to mention Seif, who supported the taxi school um, um, visit as well, but has, is changing their grant cycle um, for this spring. So they're um, anticipating that they will be completing the grant cycle prior to April vacation. And typically that cycle has happened a little bit later. But as I discussed with them today, the timing of that um, in, in the budget, <laughs> with the budget challenges we face, could be very beneficial all the way around. So just so that people are aware of that change, and I will stop there. We have lots a going on. business agenda to get through. Yes, moving on to new business. <clears throat> Item 6A, may I have a motion, please? Yes, I move that we approve the class of 2016 Project Graduation Committee fundraising in excess of $20,000 in accordance with School Board Fundraising Policy DFR. Second. Discussion. I just note that this is typically an annual request. Um, the cost of project graduation, which all of the details of which shall remain confidential at this time, um, despite our second semester seniors present in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that the fundraising typically exceeds the $20,000 threshold. And so we typically hear this time of year from project graduation folks that they anticipate exceeding that. <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6B. I move that we approve the proposed class of 2016 project graduation trip on June 12, 2016, according to board policy IHOA field trips. I second. So I just want to point out what we have this discussion, I think, almost every year that even though officially this class trip happens after graduation, it is still a school sponsored trip, so it's therefore still covered under school policy. And Principal Shedd, will you attest that you believe this trip will uh, provide students with a safe, wonderful post-graduation experience? I, I do so swear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6C, may I have a motion, please? I move that we approve this Nordic ski team trip to the state meet Kiribati Valley, Maine, February 17th to the 19th, 2016. I second. Quit any just <laughs> quick. The, the, uh, this that happens one every year. Fairly self explanatory. They typically go to the state meet. It is typically held during February vacation, and we typically approve it because it exceeds two nights. Or it and, is two nights. And it rotates every year, and this year it's at Carabasso Valley. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6D. I move that we approve a mock trial team trip to the National High School Mock Trial Tournament in Boise, Idaho, May 11th through the 15th, 2016. A second. So this trip has of late also happened every year. Um, and um, Mary Page and the mock trial team this year um, as state champions again were, um, had the opportunity to participate in the National Mock Trial Tournament and are conducting some fundraising um, at the moment and will be continuing to do that up until they leave. All those in favor? Great. <coughs> Item 6E, may I have a motion please? I'd be happy to make the motion. Uh, just one clarification, do you, uh, is it the 
proposed calendar or is it the uh, amended one with five days? As amended. With I will uh, uh, move that we approve the uh, proposed amended 2016-2017 academic year calendar, which is amended to include five professional early release days at Ponco versus the seven in the original proposal. Second it. Um, it's my we I know it is getting late this feels pretty important to me still even though it is 930 on a Tuesday night and so um, I do wish to offer more discussion at this time so it's open so I just want to say I'm happy to hear that it was called back to the five days as opposed to seven to remain more consistent with what we had approved last year um, I do have a few observations that I would like to share. Um, so I understand that we do pay for seven professional days, and those are quickly eaten up between um, the Monday afternoons, the teacher evaluation development um, process, and the changing in the state standards and the need to sort of get together and talk about that as a team on how you're going to meet those needs. And you know, you have a fabulous product that's come out this year with the new report card, so it's good to see. I'm, I'm assuming that some of that work that went into building that new report card came out of your professional development days. Um, I would like to see moving forward sort of the goals and expectations of not only the rest of the professional development days for this year if they've changed, but um, what's missing from this year's proposal is how you are again going to use those days coming up in the, in the coming year. Um, I understand that because of the schedule differences in Pong Cove, there's a limited amount of time for coming planning time. But um, we have heard from parents in the community that there is some concern about the added burden that that does place on, on families and, and um, scheduling. Not that um, there's just a, it's a, it's an added expectation for our families. So I, I think that. Also, um, I hear that especially the creative solutions with trying to find some professional development time that is of no cost to the district, especially in light of the million dollars less expected from the EPS funding is important. Um, again, as a board, I think we need to be able to say with a straight face, we, we provided these professional development days so that you could accomplish X and you had these expectations. So without that in hand, it's kind of hard to say um, this is the, I'm, I'm not quite sure I could approve the five professional development days without having a plan in hand about how those days were going to be used and what the expectations and the goals are in the end, much like we did last year. So that's sort of the major difference. Um, if it's an ongoing um, expectation that Pong Cove is going to need these extra five professional development days. Um, again, that sort of seems to be a, a slippery slope pattern if, if this is something that's going to happen every year, or is this another year of exception because there's still some planning that has to happen in the district. So those are some of the questions that are still sort of floating around in my mind around this plan. Um, and I'm also wondering just sort of with the lack of um, student attendance at the school during those extra five days. <clears throat> and I don't even know if I asked this last time, but it was a major concern to me when I heard that it was going to be seven days. Does that affect our student count days at all for the district? No. No, okay. Um, so counted as full days. They counted as full days. But I'm wondering also from a teacher and a student learning perspective, how that impacts student learning in the classroom. Um, with those extra days out of out of class, but <clears throat> um, and then also I haven't heard, and I'm wondering. I, I understand it's difficult to find the common planning time, but have we exhausted all potential other options in order to fulfill the need for that common planning time? Um, have we scrounged every little nook and cranny in the schedule and tried to squeeze out every last minute? I'm not. I'm, I'm hearing that there's a need, but I'm, I, I didn't hear that we've tried other ways, and this is the only way kind of <coughs> approach. Um, and then I'm not sure if the current plan with the five days includes the option of using high school students still, 
because that in itself, to me, I had some questions about how that then affects the classroom learning time at the high school. And if that would be for all five days, that's a lot of out of classroom time. And, and I know teachers loathe disruptions in their routines as well. So it's sort of, pardon the expression, robbing Peter to pay Paul in my mind. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm uh, comfortable with the uh, proposed schedule. I think our strategic plan, one of the uh, goals or action items is to provide more professional development time for staff. And uh, there's, there's only so many ways you, you can do it. I think we already have the feedback that trying to do more days in the summer costs more money, and two, is less effective. Uh, if you have five days in the summer, well, there's a lot of things you're going to learn in the classroom during the course of the year that you want to say, oh, that's a tool that I can use. I think the feedback from teachers is obviously they want more professional development days. That's why they were supporting seven versus five. In terms of parental feedback, I think we've received maybe three or four emails uh, saying that uh, it was a, a negative impact on instructional time. Um, so there's not an overwhelming, um, you know, this is, this is uh, impacting to such a degree a high percentage of parents, so I don't see any evidence. Um, you know, the questions asked are, what's the, are we, you know, how is this improving professional development? How is it improving instructional time? And I see no reason to hold, um, you know, Pond Cove. What, what are they doing these days any different than, the three days for K through 12 student early release. I don't recall us asking for a professional development uh, curriculum. I know the, those days, and those are early release days as well. So um, we need more professional development. There's only so many ways you can do it. I think five. Is it perfect? No. Is there a perfect number? Is it three? Is it seven? I don't know, but this is what's come before the board, and I'm comfortably comfortable approving this. And you know, as we look uh, forward, is there an opportunity to say what are other opportunities and options? Um, you know, we could explore that, but um, I'm comfortable with with the schedule as is, given we've asked for teachers to do more things, develop more skills, and they need time to to share best practices. And um, I think this is the the best uh, way to achieve that. I'd like to say again that I'm, I'm at this point not comfortable to, to vote um, on it without po possibly re considering redoing the survey to, to just to tap into the question how parents feel, how much parents value um, the, the five extra days, uh, the five half days, because uh, I, I feel like there was no room for input on that in addition to not a lot of time for that input. Um, and then the other piece that I would really appreciate feedback on is um, from the staff. Um, how helpful are they finding the, the half days for professional development versus time just to work on their curriculum? Um, how much um, is, the, is the input of the agenda for the whole year, uh, how much of that is a collaborative process? Like, are, are all the teachers allowed to work together to, to vote on you know, what they feel is the most important topic, um, to, to, the topics to, co to cover? So for me, I, I just feel like at this point, I, I still need more information um, um, for, from, most importantly, from the, the staff at this point to see how, how um, valuable this is to them. Um, Um, I would just add that my, my sense uh, was confirmed by Meredith that there is a real disparity between our middle high school and our elementary schools. And my hope would be if this is in fact determined to be uh, incredibly important to teachers, which I'm trusting the principal's judgment and what she's sharing with staff about that, I'd, I'd like this to become a little more of a regular expectation than having to hash this out every year, yep. that elementary school gets five half days a year, and they'll recommend which days they are. I don't care if it's a Monday, a Friday, I went, don't care. 
but if they need that additional 15 hours of time, I believe it because the disparity is so great with the other schools. So how, how that lands, I would prefer it to us to make an assumption that it's a need going forward than, than something we have to look at every year. And I, and I do agree with Michael that while it was nice to hear precisely what was planned for this year for the time for math, we don't ask that in any other situation. We don't ask what the eighth grade team is doing with all their release time. We don't ask what the high school math teachers are talking about. But because this feels different to us, we, we put additional pressure on to know exactly every minute. And, um, and I think we can back out of that too if in general our principals inform us how they're using their professional time. That's what I'd like to hear. A little equity around that. You know, I, I, I think it's always um, a challenge to use your time well, and you always want to do that, but I think um, professional development is recognized in the strategic plan is, is really important. The, the research and data that I've seen says that it is really important. And I, and I worry also sending it out to the parents uh, with just the question of, uh, about the, the schedule, because, you know, I see across the nation professional development is underfunded, and part of that, I think, is because it's poorly understood in terms of what the impact is. And so without sending it out with um, information about actually how we're expected to use that time and what the impact of that time, I don't, I'm not sure that you get, um, uh, without preventing it along with the impact of having that time, I think, I think you, you might get misleading information as to in terms of, would you like us to change your schedule? No, I wouldn't. So I, <laughs> that's usually the answer when you ask anybody if you'd like to change their schedule. So I'm concerned about that asking the question the wrong way and getting the wrong information. The other thing I would say is I appreciate, I do think the schedule is really important and I think the schedule for, for particularly with kids, parents with more than one child and, and younger kids and single parents and being able to have a low and no cost option so that you don't have to change your schedule and making accommodations for that is really important. And when we're bringing in changes where we're gonna have this erratic schedule when you're having early release days to able to try and mitigate that as much as possible from a schedule point of view is really is really really important that being said i think michael said very well if you're trying to get more professional development there's only so many ways you can do that and this seems to be a way that is relatively um modest impact both in terms of budget and time so uh, i i would concur that did like to move to this is what we want in terms of professional development let's make an expectation and let's try and minimize the impacts the best we can around that so I usually like to speak last so I'm gonna just go ahead and okay um, so at the heart of every decision that we as a board make needs we need to be mindful of student achievement and is this the right thing to do for students and I struggle with this one, I have to share. And I am a, a teacher from a family of teachers and teachers and teachers and teachers. Every, and, and so I believe in professional development. I believe it's probably the best bang for our buck. And I don't want to minimize professional development. And I, I just, I wanna say it over and over again. Um, my concerns, are many fold in that we haven't really even touched very much on the disruption to student learning. We haven't really touched on the fact that, you know, this is really an interruption to maximizing student in class time with their teachers and how important that is. Um, I think that there has been a, um, while valid and important discussion around interruption to um, parents' lives and the need for childcare, that is not at all the feedback that I've gotten from parents. Some people have reached out to the board as a whole. Um, a lot of people don't have the comfort level to reach out to the board as a whole and a lot of, there's, there are zero people that have reached out to me on a personal level that have spoken about childcare. They're all worried about the disruption to student learning and what those interrupted weeks look like that Barbara brought up, that we have a very high number of interrupted weeks that 
you know, I, I, I worry about that sustained learning, that capacity for learning. Um, it, so I, I just, I, while I appreciate that, that those are real concerns around families, I'm worried about the students in class with their teachers. And so that's, I'm on this scale because they're both important. Um, and I am not comfortable voting on this. I really want to explore, I, I don't know, I echo Joe. Have we explored every possible option of maximizing that time that, and I agree, so I'm, I'm feeling I'm Solomon here, and I'm splitting the baby, and I don't know, because I do believe that, that the elementary teachers probably have a, probably, a, a lack, maybe not as great as could be um, thought tonight, but there, I think there is a lack of common planning time. It's been shown. Um, but is there, you know, there's that, what happens in that half day? I, I, I understand that it, it counts as a student day. I've been in there. I volunteered. And what gets done on that half day? And what, how does that work? And, what, do, what does that count for for students? So I would love for more investigation, more creativity, just one more whack at it. How can we give some of that really important professional development time to Palm Cove teachers and minimize that disruption to student learning? So that's, that's just where I'm at. So oh, at this time, we can either table the motion, amend the motion, or vote on it as is. So it's Michael's motion. So someone else can move to amend. Someone or else Michael can move to amend or withdraw, or someone could call the vote. <clears throat> so is there? An amendment. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little conflicted like you. Again, I, I agree that there's a great need for professional development time. There's a great need to do that with as less impact to the budget as possible. I'm not comfortable with missing some of the answers that I had expressed before. So I, maybe I'll make the motion then that if we could just um, table the um, motion as as is with the amended five days and um, maybe work with Kelly through uh, Meredith to see if there's some further information and some answers that we can get as a board to move forward. That was a messy motion, wasn't it? I move we table for further information. Until? Until the next business meeting. So I'd like to second. So we need a second on. I'd, I'd like to second that motion, okay. partly because I think this is a really important uh, topic for the board, and I think it would be uh, important for us to speak with as much unanimity as possible mm -hmm. on the topic. Thank you. So at the time, do we vote on Joe's motion and not Michael's? Yes. Okay. Just want to do this the right way. On tabling the motion. Okay. So all those in favor. Six or seven. So can we have all those in all favor? Those in favor. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the robust discussion around this. It's an important topic. And so at the, at the risk of belaboring this, I just want to be clear about it, what you're looking for from us. I heard a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. I heard um, some additional feedback from faculty as well as feedback from parents. I heard some additional thinking about how else we might be able to um, find time for this work. I heard um, uh, what happens if we use high school students to their time. I, I, <laughs> it's a long list. Well, there, there are sort of a lot of implications. Pieces, so I, I guess I'm trying to understand. Yes, so far you've got you all of the above. Batting a thousand. Okay. Um, and 
and the impact on learning, which I think that's going to be difficult to gauge, just, yeah. um, other than through through a qualitative feedback yeah. um, on the survey. But I, I remember a, a point being made last year about um, the half days and, and teachers, none that were present, but teachers who have people here who have taught, saying that the the change in schedule is difficult and disruptive to their um, their whole week, and so that that's more of the feedback I'd like to hear from staff. So you're trying to understand from a staff perspective what's the trade-off on the benefits of yes. the professional development yes. versus the impact on student learning. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for similar feedback from a parental perspective? I, I would like to get a, a more, um, yes, yes. That's, sorry. One, one um, thing that could be added to the discussion, Meredith, is, is is uh, part of what I spoke about earlier was when you lose a whole half day that it, you really have to look at your week schedule and how you and I know a big part of it is the bus so might the early release start later so you're losing you know less of your day so if you plan to have a content area piece in the afternoons that's the one thing you lose and that's more easy to reschedule than a, a missed math for example so Backing off from when the run happens for the middle school, high school, to be able to get the kids home. You, right. Might that be more amenable for people? So you could still have a good solid two and a half, three hours, um, and be less disruptive to the school day? That might be one consideration I'd ask to be explored. I appreciate any creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And then, Meredith, there's one other thing. I mean, we are asking for professional development time common planning time because there's a need. Um, like last year, I think that we need to know what that need is and what the time will be used for. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I appreciate uh, that all these requests we're making. I just think it uh, we're, sounds like we're getting in pretty deep in the weeds uh, on this. So um, there's about eight items we requested. So. You know, we just did a parent survey. We were, were going to request another parent survey. Uh, you know, teacher, you know, so I think we can keep shouting out ideas. I don't know how practical, um, you know, are we, we really want to do another parent survey on the heels of one we just requested. So um, it might be helpful to have maybe two or three specific items the board wants to help them make uh, the decision. Is it, do teachers want five days? <clears throat> yes or no, um, you know. So I, I, you know, I'm not sure we're giving the superintendent really a whole lot to go with right now. So uh, for those that, you know, want more information, you may be, you know, what, what are the three things you want? And I hear you, Michael, and I appreciate that. Although I did, I felt that the, um, I don't feel that the survey presented to us tonight was actually helpful. I don't know that we need to redo it. I think we understand that there are disruptions in family life and that there are grave concerns around um, disruption to student learning. I don't think that we're going to get a lot of, I think we've got that. Um, even with a better design survey, I, I think we've got that. And while that is part of what we take in, we really need to hear more from, I think, our teachers and some creative problem solving around alternatives. alternatives. And do we want to be keeping in mind if this is a one-year change or if we're acknowledging the different schedule that's happening in Pond Cove and if this is going to be a more permanent um, situation because it's going to be keep asking it's right. going to be continually asked for I think that's our approach may be a little bit different mm -hmm. if we know what that goal if is. it was going right. to be an ongoing thing we might not need to have that explanation of that time right, uh, I, right. I, would, I would concur I think any suggestion we're going to make going forward we want to be a durable proposal because having vision on what's coming up is also what helps minimize the disruption to student learning yeah. absolutely and that yeah. speaks to the why and the how. Right. It explains mm -hmm. the decision. Yeah. OK. 
Have we narrowed it down for you a little bit? A little bit. <laughs> we'll be okay. She'll replay the tape later. Take. Thank you again. Oh. No, all I'm going to say is we go on vacation next week. We have then two weeks before our next meeting. If we don't have time to address all of this at the same time that we're also doing budget, you may not get a calendar proposal until April, but we will do our best to do both of these simultaneously. I'm just mindful that if we are asking for additional feedback, it could be a tight timeline. I have a question about that. Is, uh, is there anyone really asking to know our start, our end dates, when the vacations are, and so forth, so that we could vote on that much and then bring in the early release in a, in a later vote? I've not heard a lot of that. I mean, and I think anyone in the public who's kind of following this discussion understands that given the parameters of needing okay. to align our calendar, we have that would be helpful that or not. Dates are set. Okay. Um, I noticed that the proposed start date is pretty late in August. I think if we were proposing a start date, It's September. September, sorry. I'm, I'm reading August, September. I don't mm -hmm. have my readers on. I think if we were proposing an earlier start date, that would be mission critical to help families, especially plan summertime, but um, that's a pretty late start date. Uh, to Barbara's question, I think we could adopt the calendar at the March meeting, even if we have not finalized right. the early release right. piece, and that would give the public. Right, the ability to plan. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I think that's appropriate. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> Item 6F, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve Cape Elizabeth's past part one and two budget costs for 2016-2017 in the amount of $55,249.73. Part one, $54,659.59. Part two, $590.14. Second. Discussion. So PAS is the Portland Area Technical High School. The Part 1 costs are set by the bylaws of that organization and the um, agreements that, that have been established. They are essentially um, derived from enrollment over a two-year period. And then the average sort of cost per student that, that PASS um, has during that same time period. The Part 2 costs are, are basically additional capital items equipment items that PAS purchases. So for example, replacement, um, a kitchen, uh, kitchen equipment for the culinary arts program. Um, a replacement, I can't even think, you could probably name it, the, like a new water sprinkler or something. Yeah, so well, I was thinking, you know, like what's the thing you paint your car with that has a very fancy title oh. um, for the automotive program. Paintbrush. There's my knowledge of the, automotive the spray, on display. Spray, um, spray can. <laughs> <my> <laughs> <laughs> yes, a large version <laughs> of a spray can. Um, so the, that's where the Part 2 costs come from. For us, it is a $19 increase above our current year PAS costs, um, again, based on the enrollment over the two-year period okay. and the equipment costs. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6G. I move that we approve the following job description, Achievement Center Coordinator. Second. <coughs> Discussion. So this um, job description was included in your prior packet as an informational item, so you would have time to review it. I've not received any input questions or suggestions um, related to it. Um, the Achievement Center Coordinator's position at the high school Oh, I need to save it. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6H, may I have a motion please? Yes, you may. I move we approve the following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations for the 2015-2016 school year as listed under agenda item 6H. Second. And discussion? Just note that these are, um, I believe, all, maybe one exception, returning um, coaches and advisors for programs. 
Um, they've all been interviewed and vetted by our building administrators um, prior to coming to me and prior to being submitted to the board. All of the stipends for these positions um, have been determined through the collective bargaining agreement. And just to kind of make a budgetary note, there are no new positions. That's correct. These are positions that already are in our budget. Okay. I would just add once again my appreciation for people stepping up to these roles because it's it's just hugely important for our kids to. And I see a lot of familiar names, so I think that's a, that's terrific. Important connections. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? All those in favor? Oh, thank oh. You. I'm sorry. I did it once. <laughs> okay. We were just quicker. <laughs> Item 6I. May I have a motion, please? Yes, you may. I move we approve the superintendent's recommendations for administrators continuing contract renewals for the 2016-17 and 2017-2018 school years. Uh, for uh, Jeff Shedd, Jeff Thorak, Mike Tracy, Doug Purley, Kelly Hassan, Noel Haroff, Ruth Ellen Vaughn. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Are you, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Girl looks so. at me and I am writing down. Um, Motion. Um, so all of our administrators, um, I'm recommending all of them for continuing contract. The non-probationaries. These are all the non-probationary administrators. Probationary um, window happens a little bit later, so these are all of our non-probationary administrators. Um, all of them um, are, have been evaluated. The board has had the opportunity to hear um, a synopsis of, of those evaluations, and um, here we are. And there's one administrator's contract that's missing. It's because we don't have a person in that position. That would be the director of special education. Correct. OK, we appreciate everybody staying this late to hear this. That's why we put it at the end. <laughs> you guys are, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you didn't dare leave. <laughs> so we uh, thank you for your service to the district. and. Um, understand the hard work that everybody is doing toward um, evaluations, and we will be discussing this, um, getting, getting check-ins on evaluations at, for, at another meeting. Okay. So all those in favor? Oh Did everybody raise their hand? Oh, yes. yes. This, this time you're awake. Everybody's awake. Go ahead. Go. May I have a motion, please? Yes, you may. I, approve, <laughs> I move that we approve the town council's uh, Transfer of oversight for community services, including the Donald Richards community pool from the school board to the town council. I'll second. Thank second. you. So, is this effective immediately? <laughs> no, this would be effective July 1, um, but the town council would um, assume the responsibility for the budget development process for FY17. Hence, that's no longer on our budget process calendar. Correct. For the upcoming. Yes. I think that was an important distinction to be made because my understanding was that, yeah, we, we still had oversight until July 1, but then we're not doing financial oversight. So thank so, you for the clarification. So in the short term, we retain the financial oversight for community services, and I retain, I, I retain um, supervision and evaluation responsibilities for Russell Packett, who's the director of community services, and on July 1, those responsibilities as well will transfer to the town. Um, I'll just add that last night the town council unanimously approved this um, move for community services to become its own municipal department, uh, much like every other depart uh, community services or rec department in the state of Maine. So I just want to throw that out there for you. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6K, may I have a motion, please? Yes, I move that we approve the appointment of Heather Altenberg and John Bolt to the Town Council's committee to study the proposed use of the Spurwing School Building. Okay. Second. Second. Um, I would personally like to thank our two newest members of the committee for stepping up. I think the work looks really fascinating and interesting. 
I really hope you enjoy it. It's great. Thank you. So I will just add that um, the town council had robust debate around this last night and um, settled on their, the town council chair is going to appoint one citizen kind of at large to join this committee. So the committee makeup has, will change only slightly and they will be developing a charge for the committee. But I too thank Heather and John for stepping up to do this work and um, I, I, I expect some interesting things to come out of it. So thank you. All those in favor. Thank you. <coughs> committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? I'll, I'll just mention that the policy committee um, with the two new members of John and Heather will be meeting next on February 29th at 7.30 a.m. Monday, February 29th, to be prepared for the March meeting. Great. Any other committee reports? I hear tell that the Finance Committee has postponed the budget review till March. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate, I personally appreciate that, and I know that the administrative team appreciates that as well. Well, I appreciate the hard work that that's gonna take yeah. is to come back through that. Thank you. So moving on to school board agenda requests. Yeah, I would, I would like to uh, put on the agenda request uh, a, a review of the evaluation process as, as it stands right now, since I believe we have to vote um, on it pretty quickly, April or so. So if you put that on the agenda, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other agenda requests? Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Thank you to Barbara, who covered that one oh. early. Oh, sorry. No, no. Just Don't didn't want to sound that. like the policy committee was slacking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We appreciate efficiency. <laughs> um, any other announcements of upcoming meetings? So just, again, there will be no school board workshop on the 23rd of February. Instead, the first budget workshop will be Tuesday, March 1st, and that meeting is held in the high school library learning commons and will be videotaped um, for members of the public and posted um, online great and item 10 i have a motion please i move that we adjourn <laughs> second <laughs> all those in favor yeah. thank you everyone mike